If we could ask everyone to take their seats, please. Hearing come to order. Today's hearing concerns one of the most basic responsibilities of the Oversight Committee, eliminating wasteful spending and fraud in the Federal Government. Yesterday's release of the latest GAO high-risk list presents an occasion to renew our focus on this priority and look forward to hearing from the United States Controller, Mr. Dodaro, not only about the positive results and developments, but about the continuing struggle that affects 83 percent of all executive branch spending. There really is no celebration for good news possible where we have a $1.6 trillion deficit. But every dollar saved through elimination of waste, fraud, abuse of any sort that costs the American taxpayer money should be applauded, encouraged, and, as they say in Las Vegas, double down on. It is my intention to work closely with the GAO and watchdog groups in the days and weeks to come to ensure that the House and the Senate do everything possible to have the good news we will hear about today and the challenge that remain ahead be, in fact, our highest priority. With, uh, with deference to all the other members who are returning, uh, I would ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days in order to place their opening statements in the record without objection. The, uh, the Chair now would like to uh, swear in the first panel. And let me go to that part. You know, it is probably easier not to rise. I will just make sure I say it correctly. Okay, my committee staff is swearing that we need to rise. I saw it seated yesterday, so I knew it could be done. That is better. Thank you. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you are about to give in the, to this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect that all members uh, of the panel answered yes. Please be seated. Now, you may feel like the first panel, but my, my talking points say I am recognizing the second panel because of the Senator. So, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce the Honorable Jean Dodaro, who is the Controller of the United States. Ms. Deborah Carmer Hines, who is Vice President and Partner of IBM Public Sector. Mr. Vincent Flakes, who is the Federal Policy Director at the Center for Health Transformation. And Dr. DeRuby. Uh, is a senior research fellow at Mercatus Center uh, at George Mason University. Welcome. And, uh, uh, General, your Controller General, you have done this so many times, so it will be for anyone who hasn't. Uh, your entire record, your entire written statements will be placed in the record. The goal of your opening statement is not to read it in its totality but to uh, use the five minutes in a way to, uh, to enhance or augment. We will not stop you exactly at five minutes, but when it turns red, please find a way to wrap up your oral statements. With that, we recognize the Controller General for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning to you, Ranking Member Cummings, all the members of the uh, committee. I would like to commend you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing in the committee. Uh, it is a good opportunity for us to discuss our high-risk list that we keep updated and unveil at the beginning of each new Congress to help set the oversight agenda, not only for the Congress, 
but also to give the administration a road map as well as to what areas they should be working diligently on. Uh, the 30 areas that we have on the high risk list right now represent tremendous opportunities to save billions of dollars and if uh, actions are taken appropriately to improve the performance and accountability of the Federal Government for the benefit of the American people. Uh, so they represent tremendous opportunities. I will highlight a few areas that I think, apropos this hearing, will be of interest and then be happy to talk about any of the areas. Uh, first, there are the Medicare and Medicaid programs. These are complex programs uh, that are highly susceptible to billions of dollars in improper payments. When we first put these programs on the high risk list, there really were no measures of improper payments. And thanks to legislation and administrative initiatives, now there are estimates of the amount of improper payments, but the work is just beginning. There is a long way to go to bring these improper payments and the billions of dollars under control and to really provide the type of accountability. A lot will depend on how successful agencies are in implementing the new Improper Payments Elimination and Recovery Act, which this committee sponsored and supported. And as you know, that act introduces a lot more rigor into the statistical nature of the estimates. It lowers the th thresholds to make sure more things are reported uh, appropriately. It requires corrective actions and identification of the causes of the improper payments more rigorous reporting, accountability to be uh, fixed, uh, and it will also require uh, recovery of those monies where they, it's appropriate and uh, possible to make the recovery. So this legislation has a lot of potential, and I would uh, you know, respectfully recommend that the committee uh, figure out a way, and I know I think it's already in your plans and your oversight plans, to make sure a follow-up on how agencies are implementing this improper payments legislation. You know, in some areas, like the Medicare Part D uh, prescription drug part of Medicare, there is not, not even an estimate yet. So the estimates that are being made to date aren't yet complete. So this has tremendous potential, and we would be happy to work with you uh, in doing this. It also has potential across government. Uh, second area has to do with uh, unused Federal property. And as we know, uh, and has been reported in 2009, uh, the Federal agencies identified over 45,000 buildings, Federal buildings, that are either not being used or being underutilized. And the government is incurring an annual operating cost to, uh, for these buildings of about $1.7 billion a year. Uh, clearly, there is a need to move forward and to dispose of these buildings properly, eliminate this unnecessary uh, operating cost. There is also costly leasing opportunities uh, that could be revisited as well. So that is another target. Uh, also, in DOD Weapon Systems Acquisition, as Senator McCaskill mentioned, uh, the Congress passed the Weapon Systems Acquisition Reform Act in 2009, and that included a lot of important reforms to come up with better cost estimates uh, and also uh, better uh, accountability in terms of reporting on those areas. But our reviews of the weapon systems portfolios have shown billions of dollars in cost growth in those activities and longer periods of time uh, to deliver the weapon systems. So it is costing a lot more than originally uh, uh, expected, and it is delaying the implementation of this. We have made a number of recommendations to better prioritize the weapon systems portfolios, to put in more uh, diligent business practices and business cases, technology maturity levels before investments are made, uh, and also to uh, make sure uh, that there is proper oversight and control over the, that whole process. Uh, as Senator McCaskill also mentioned, there are a wide range of other DOD business practices, whether they be in the logistics support contract management and other areas that are also on the high risk list that provide opportunities uh, for more uh, improvement, streamlining and eliminating of the government's cost. Uh, the bottom line is, Mr. Chairman, there are tremendous opportunities out there uh, for correcting these high risk problems that we have identified. Agencies are working on it. I am pleased to, to report uh, that we have had a series of meetings that with uh, OMB and the agencies on the high risk list and GAO to talk about more specific uh, actions that need to be taken. 
to come off this list. Congressional oversight is important. Uh, the only areas that we have taken off the list have been ones where the Congress has been diligent in conducting oversight. The two we took off this year, over a dozen congressional hearings were held on both the Census area and the DOD personnel security clearance area uh, since the time we put them on the list to them coming off the list. And so it is a major factor, but you need also top-level agency commitment on the part of the administration. I can assure you that it is going to be a top priority at the GAO uh, to continue to focus on these activities and to do what we can to try to uh, help be specific, maintain our independence. We are not going to take anything off the list until it is deserved to be taken off the list. Uh, but our goal is to try to provide as much specificity as we can to how to get these problems fixed and remedied. We can't afford anymore to have these problems continue. So thank you very much, and I look forward to uh, answering questions. Thank you. Ms. Carmer? Ma'am, is, is it Cammer? It's Cammer. Cammer. Okay. Yes. I will try to keep it correct. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the committee, Thank you for inviting me to appear before you today to discuss how the IBM Corporation believes that Federal agencies can improve their efficiency and reduce costs through the application of commercial best practices. My name is Deborah Kammer Hines, and I am the Public Sector Consulting Leader for IBM in North America. In that role, I oversee all of IBM's consulting activities at the Federal, State, and local level. Prior to becoming a management consultant, I worked as a Federal Credit Policy Analyst at the Office of Management and Budget. In this role, I performed budgetary, credit, economic, and policy analysis in the review of credit programs across the Federal Government. We recently authored a report entitled Strategies to Cut Costs and Improve Performance. The purpose of this report was to help advance the ongoing national dialogue about our Federal fiscal crisis by offering seven specific initiatives where technology-enabled productivity solutions can make a material difference in the performance of Federal programs. These seven initiatives include, one, consolidate information, technology, infrastructure, two, streamline government supply chains, three, reduce energy use, four, move to shared services for mission support activities, Five, apply advanced business analytics to reduce improper payments. Six, reduce field operations footprint and move to electronic self-service. And seven, monetize the government's assets. We estimate that the aggressive implementation of these seven initiatives can generate a trillion dollars in savings over 10 years. These savings would be generated through improved performance rather than through program reductions or tax increases. Federal agencies, and State and local governments for that matter, spend a great deal of energy collecting and dispersing funds. They collect taxes and fees from citizens and businesses, and they disperse funds to organizations and individuals through a wide variety of programs. These activities generate large volumes of transactions, and as a consequence, they are vulnerable to both honest mistakes in administration as well as intentional efforts to defraud. The good news for governments at all levels is that these types of programs lend themselves to what we call predictive analytics. So to put it simply, predictive analytics is a collection of statistical techniques that when applied to a large number of transactions being processed through a standard business process can reveal patterns that are indications of fraud, abuse, or simply poor management. Several Federal agencies apply predictive analytics today, most notably the IRS and the Department of Health and Human Services. However, we believe that deeper investment in these techniques and the broader applications of the lessons that have been learned in private sector settings can improve the performance of these efforts and yield significant new savings. Let me describe one example of how the application of these types of tools is already generating real results. The State of New York hired IBM after the State's tax department estimated it was losing a billion dollars annually in improper tax refunds. IBM built a predictive model that scores every refund request on the likelihood that it was valid. The 4 percent of returns deemed the most questionable were rejected outright. Investigators examined others considered high risk to decide whether or not they were valid. And over the last six years, the State has denied $1.2 billion in improper refunds even taking into account the successful appeals. 
Today, the state continues to run the program on its own, and we have, we have similar programs with other states and local governments that I would be glad to share. It is important to note that many Federal agencies are focused on these issues and are making important strides. OMB, for example, should be applauded for working in partnerships with the state, Federal agencies and others to identify innovative ways to reduce improper payments, improve administrative efficiency, enhance service delivery, and reduce access barriers to federally funded, state-administered benefits programs. More can and should be done. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Frakes? Thank you. Chairman Issa, Congressman Cummings, and member of the committee, thank you for holding this hearing today and inviting me to participate. My name is Vincent Frakes, and I am the Federal Policy Director at the Center for Health Transformation. Decreasing and hopefully eliminating waste, fraud, and abuse in our health care system is vital to improving quality of care and lowering health care costs. The Center for Health Transformation has worked extensively on these issues and with many of our members to find solutions to this dilemma. Fraud and abuse places a massive burden on government and consequently on American taxpayers. On Monday, President Obama released his budget for the upcoming year. In his budget, the President noted that the gross Federal debt will exceed $15 trillion this year, which is equal to the size of the entire U.S. economy. This is unsustainable. A recent Thomson Reuters study found that between $600 billion and $850 billion of health care spending annually is wasted, and up to $175 billion of that is in pure fraud. Fraudulent and wasteful spending is low-hanging fruit that can and should be used to reduce this debt. There is broad bipartisan consensus that fraud and abuse within Medicare and Medicaid must be addressed and can make a significant dent in our nation's government spending. Unfortunately, little has been done to curb these harmful practices. Outright criminality imp imp uh, imposes the largest and most high-profile burden on this system. Crooks have figured out how to game the system, and they must be stopped. Take, for example, an Orange County, California cancer doctor who was charged in April of last year with fraudulently billing Medicare and health insurance companies close to $1 million for administering injectable cancer medications that were never provided. Or the Miami area clinic consultant who was convicted last May of health care fraud in connection with a $5.8 million Medicare scheme in which the clinic was falsely claiming to administer HIV injection and infusion treatments. Countless examples of these types of fraud exist around the country, and their practice must be eliminated. Doing so could save the government and the American taxpayers more than a trillion dollars over the next 10 years. Unfortunately, the vast majority of these crimes go undetected. Medicare and Medicaid are des designated as quote unquote high risk programs by the GAO, and their improper payment rate exceeds 10 percent. Compare that to the less than one tenth of one percent fraud rate that exists in the credit card industry which conducts more than $2 trillion annually in, in transactions and has nearly 1 billion credit cards in circulation. The primary reason for this success is utilizing real-time technology that pre-screens payments before they go out the door. CMS would be wise to learn from these private sector successes. There are three concrete solutions that can be taken immediately to improve Medicare and Medicaid and begin to solve the fiscal crisis that we find in ourselves with these programs. First, we must incorporate private sector solutions to identify, monitor, and ultimately prevent fraud and abuse. Companies like Humetrix and NCN are on the front lines of utilizing data tracking models to head off fraud and errors on the front end in order to save the private and public payers significant amounts of money on the back end. There is no reason that these same systems can't be utilized at the federal level as well. Second, we must introduce significant changes to the current system of electronic data tracking and, and data sharing across jurisdictions and departments. That includes utilizing a single unified depository of information to reduce wasted resources that are expended on cross-referencing potential crooks. Real-time data tracking can identify irregularities at a moment's notice across state and provider venues. Third, we must institute a comprehensive and transparent model of supplier approval and fraudulent claims administration as well as encourage the implementation of more intelligent systems and schemes to reduce waste and fraud in the system. There are many more steps that can be taken, as my written testimony explores, but these are first and foremost in terms of importance. Not only do we need to aggressively attack the roots of fraud and abuse in the system, but we also need to solve the primary reason for, for waste, and that is defensive medicine. One major reason that providers order unnecessary services is due to, defense, is due to the fear of potential legal action. Predatory litigators cause physicians to, pr to practice defensive medicine, 
ordering far more tests, and providing far more services and procedures that are necessary. This drives the cost through the roof. Jackson Healthcare and Gallup recently released a poll of physicians where physicians said that more than a quarter of all healthcare services that they deliver, more than $600 billion a year, are unnecessary and delivered solely to reduce their liability risks. Congressman Gingrey, Lamar Smith, and David Scott recently introduced H.R. 5, the Health Act, which you co-sponsored, Mr. Chairman, and as did other members of this committee, that includes meaningful medical liability reforms while strengthening a doctor-patient relationship. This reform is crit as a critical step to eliminating defensive medicine, lowering costs, and expanding access to care. Waste, fraud, and abuse run rampant in our nation's health care system, but with fundamental changes in how government uses technology, properly screens providers, involves law enforcement, and incorporates legal reform, we can save trillions of dollars and fundamentally transform our health care system to one that delivers more choices of better quality at a lower cost for every American. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Dr. DeRashi. Uh. Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cumming, Distinguished Member of this Committee, thank you for the opportunity to come before you today to testify. My name is Véronique DeRugy. I'm a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, where I study tax and budget issues. Fraud, waste, and abuse are indeed problems worthy of a congressional attention. However, the $125 billion in overt waste that comes from improper payment pales in comparison to the waste that exists in current congressional spending patterns and the economic damage caused by the misallocation of capital and the creation of perverse incentives. First, this waste occurs when the federal government spends money on private sector functions. Having the government runs businesses such as Amtrak and oversee infrastructure such as the air traffic control system is not just inefficient. It also hinders economic growth and costs the taxpayers money while providing low quality service to customers. Second, this waste also occurs when the federal government spends money on functions in the purview of the states. President Reagan wrote that Federalism is rooted in the knowledge that our political liberties are best assured by limiting the size and scope of the national government. Sadly, Congress has ignored this advice and is now spending $500 billion in grants to states for activity that it has no legal or practical reason to be involved in, such as healthy marriage promotion and museum professional training grants. It is inefficient and creates an unacceptable lack of accountability. The waste also occurs because when lawmakers are busy running state, local, and private affairs, they have less time to oversee federal agencies and focus on critical national issues such as defense and security. But their largest and most recent example of wasteful federal spending occurred under the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. Much of the money in the bill was spent, and yet unemployment hovers around 9 percent, higher than the 8.8 percent unemployment rate that the administration threatened the country would face if Congress did not pass the gigantic stimulus bill. Evidence like this just confirmed what many scholars had predicted all along. Government spending can't jumpstart an economy. As a result, many have concluded that the stimulus package was a waste. The practical realities witnessed by the American taxpayers bear out the academic truth. The stimulus spending was not, that did not deliver on the promises made, unemployment remains high, and it has saddled the country with more debt. What would increase employment and stimulate economic growth is investment, private investment, not government spending labeled as investment. But the American companies are not investing their capital, and some $1.8 trillion in capital is sitting on the sideline. Why? Because entrepreneurs and risk takers are acting very ca cautiously out of fear of the future. Economists and the business community agree recent policy change have hampered business investment, making a bad situation worse. The prospect of endless future debt and deficit raises the threat of increased taxes and government crowding out capital markets. Uncertainty prevails. As a result, U.S. companies don't build new plants, they don't conduct research, and they don't hire people. People stay unemployed for weeks, months, years. You are the representative of the American taxpayers. 
You are the stewards of the nation's finances. You want the economy to grow. You want people to be employed. Then you must realize that the federal government cannot be and should not be the solution to every one of our problems. There are things that only the federal government can do. But when the federal government gets involved where it shouldn't be, it wastes capital, time, and taxpayers' money. Understanding this will guide you in making hard decisions about where to cut spending. However, it also means that you must put all spending on the table. Congress needs to make sure that no area of the budget are untouchable, not entitlement, not defense spending. All part of the budget must be on the table for review and potential cuts. Finally, you need to put in place now serious, strict, and unavoidable budget rules that ties Congress's hand and restore fiscal discipline. With such reform, the American people will start having confidence in their future again. The country will be on the road to recovery and prosperity. Thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to your questions. I first want to thank all of you for being very, very close to that five minutes. That's uh, pretty close to a record. I'd recognize myself for five minutes. You each gave a different perspective. I'm, I'm, in five minutes, it's going to be hard to go through all of them, but I'm going to start with Mr. Frakes. When you gave those numbers, one of the things that I found interesting was you went through defensive medicine as a major part, and, and that's beyond the scope, perhaps, of this committee. Other committees will be dealing with it. But when you looked at the $178 billion in outright payments for either procedures that didn't occur or even in some cases to entities that weren't even what they claimed to be, what do you believe, or has your, your organization studied what you believe it would cost the Federal Government to avoid all or part of that? Where, where's the sweet spot? Would a billion dollars in, in a system to attack that kind of waste uh, or that kind of false payments yield far more than a billion dollars? Certainly. Uh, we have seen it through the private sector, through IBM and others, um, that if you put in money on the front end, it, it will yield significant results and much greater results on the back end. Um, when when I am talking about putting in money at the front to really curb this idea of stopping suppliers and checking things before they go out the door, you are going to see a massive increase in the number of um, drops in, in numbers of you know, fraudulent payments, fraudulent suppliers that exist um, to the tune of, of if anything, if you put in a billion dollars, you are going to see a much higher yield. Uh, those numbers we, we are not insignificant and they are going to be incredibly influential in terms of cutting things off. There is uh, this thought out there that if you apply to be a Medicare or a Medicaid supplier that you are automatically granted that. Um, and that's not simply not the case. We need to be doing a much better job of putting in front end money that will yield much higher savings as a result of cutting off fraudulent suppliers and so forth. Controller Dodaro, if if are you you're familiar with uh, uh, the uh, recovery uh, organizations' efforts, their website and their database management, uh, my understanding is that was a couple of million dollars, and they have found you know, like $80 million in one example only of what would have been the losses uh, through M Medicare fraud in which the organizations that were doing it had actually stolen uh, other doc doctors' identification and so on. Can you comment a little bit on how do we get from you and other uh, watchdog uh, organizations, how do we get the numbers so that we can find a way to fund programs similar to uh, Chairman Devaney's? Yeah, I, I uh, would be happy to provide some additional details, but uh, what I would say is that I agree completely that an upfront investment targeting certain areas that you know that have high rates of, of issues like home health services, for example, and other areas to book controls in upfront would be a very appropriate investment to be made. We have made recommendations along those lines. We are looking at prepayment. Uh, controls right now. In a but free payment controls yeah. are a big step. You know, right. That is sort of back to that $80 billion that we can't seem to get well spent in IT expenditures. One of my, que my real question here and why I picked out that 100, anyway, there are all kinds of numbers in fairness. I have seen it as low as $70 billion, you know, just a rounding error, I guess, all the way up to approaching $200 billion in payments made in Medicare for services not provided or in many cases provided to entities that were not even what they said they were. Mm -hmm. How do we attack that in a way, 
and I'm specifically looking at Earl Devaney's work, because he, that wasn't even in his main target, but because stimulus funds were used there, he was able to stand up, and I, I believe it was less than $2 million, and he's already headed off a scam that was just anecdotal uh, analysis. How do, we, how do we get, with GAO's help, hopefully, the ability for this committee to make a case to Congress at a time in which it seems like we are cutting, cutting, to make, and perhaps, perhaps that $2 million is enough, yeah. but to make that kind of investment and then score the savings so that if we spend $5 million to save $500 million, mm -hmm. we then see the opportunity to spend 10 times that to save 10 times that. Yes, no, no, I understand uh, what, what you're saying, and I, I agree with that. I mean, we can uh, work with Earl. I think that we're going to try to use his system in the health care area and on an experimental basis and to try to come up with some proposals for that detection kind of capability up front with the relationships between different entities and the screening that was done. So I, 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 we'd be happy to, to try to come up with a proposal uh, that we could discuss with you. Yep. Ms. Kammer? If I could just ask you one question as the private sector representative here, if we were able to score it, do you believe the private sector, the way they have in the past with the IRS, uh, would, they, would you believe private sector would be in, interested in, in working on, if you will, a bounty system, one in which it costs nothing to the government unless we save many times that? Yeah, so what you're talking about is um, an example of what we did with the state of North Carolina and that we're operating right now with their um, their Medicare and Medicaid payments. And so we have implemented that. And, and my time is expired. So just briefly, okay. what have you saved? Yeah, so it's an outcome based approach. And we have start, so that has just started, and we have um, identified opportunities for them to go after that. And I don't have the number right in front of me, but I believe it's in my written testimony. But you only get a small part of whatever we they get. Claim. We get a 10 percent of what gets identified, yeah. Thank you. I recognize the gentleman from uh, Maryland. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Chairman. And you, all of your testimony is fascinating and is so very, very important. Um, first of all, let me go back, Mr. Uh, Zadaro, to something that uh, Senator McCaskill was talking about. You were here when she was testifying. You will recall that she said um, basically don't cut your nose off to spite your face with regard to funding for agencies like yours. Are you satisfied with the funding that you have to do your job? Uh, you're going to have to answer that quickly, unfortunately, because yes, I got a yeah, lot of questions. Yeah, no. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, I've requested, given the uh, fiscal uh, uh, situation in the country, that our funding level be kept flat at 2010 fiscal year levels, and I'd be satisfied if our funding was kept at that level. Thank you. N another question is: um, during your, your testimony, you talked about the folks that you were, the agencies that you were able to take off the list, and you said that, it seemed, that you saw something very interesting and that they seem to have been come under the most, come under the most scrutiny by the Congress. Is that a fair statement? Uh, yes. There was sustained congressional attention in both of those areas. And, Mr. Chairman, I, you know, that, what he just said I think is so crucial. We saw that with the regard to the Coast Guard. When we stayed on top of them, we got it done and got it done in a little bit of time, saving millions of, millions of dollars in a short period of time because it was that sustained effort. Um, federal contracting has expanded uh, over the last 10 years uh, and to over $500 billion. According to your report, GAO has included the Defense Department's contract management on the high risk list since 1992. DOD weapon systems acquisition and supply chain management have been on the list uh, uh, even longer since uh, 1990. Mr. Dodaro, is anyone able to quantify how much of DOD's contracting budget over these past 20 years has been lost to waste, fraud, or abuse? I am not aware of any estimate of that nature. And one of the things that made me realize, and I had said this to the, uh, the Coast Guard folks, I believe that we were caught up in a culture that was the Coast Guard was caught up in a coach culture of mediocrity. And then it made me, when I saw a statement by uh, Secretary Gates, it made me wonder about our Defense Department being caught up in a culture of mediocrity when it comes to these kinds of issues, particularly on contracting out. He says, uh, Secretary Gates said, I can't get a, a uh, number 
on how many contractors work for the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Are you surprised by that statement? Uh, no, I am not. That is sad, isn't it? I think that there is plenty of room for improvement in the Defense Department's uh, uh, business uh, areas. Uh, for example, they are one of the few and the largest department that has yet been able to get a, a, a financial audit and an unqualified opinion. I mean, they're, uh, they, they're in need of some major reforms uh, and better data in order to manage by. I'm going to go back to uh, something Ms. Ms. Cameron said. And, and um, you know, I was telling saying to my staff that you, you've done a great advertisement for IBM. Um, the, and I'm just wondering why, and following up on what the Chairman was asking about, is there any way we can incorporate, and is there anything that Congress can do, Dr., uh, Mr. Darrow, to incorporate those kinds of things. One of the things that Devaney has said to our committee, he said, I want to stop the fraud before it happened. I will never forget him saying that. And I want to stop the mismanagement before it happens. And I think he's probably done that. So is there any way we can, can do those kinds of things, the kinds of things that some of our other witnesses talked about from the very beginning? Are you following? And what would, would, it, be take, would, it, would it take us to do that? What would we need? Well, I think you need to have uh, well-developed plans with the agencies. P part of this is changing the culture shift from a pay-and-chase type of an approach. And there was a lot of emphasis on getting the money out the door fast and not always with screening it up front. So changing that cultural shift, putting some additional requirements in place, and well-targeted investments that are developed and tailored to the programs. Going back to DOD, we have a situation where we have got private contractors, and we saw this in the Coast Guard you got private contractors being hired to oversee private contractors, which is, again, that goes to that culture of mediocrity. Does that make any sense? And how can we get around that? That definitely increases the risk. I mean, part of the problem is the contracting amounts of, of funds at DOD is, have gone like this. The acquisition workforce has been relatively flat. They haven't adapted to have the right type of oversight. Uh, part of the problem is you can never contract out the government's decisions on what the requirements ought to be in terms and then provide an effective oversight over that area. The lack of definitive requirements is something we see time and time again in changing requirements and not applying uh, good business practices and having a good business case in the beginning uh, before the investments are made or the contracts are let. I see my time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Uh, Fahrenheit. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I had a couple of questions. My, my first question is we are talking about you know, billions of dollars in fraud and waste. And I think I know the answer to this question, but I have learned in government it is better to ask the question. When you are scoring the amount of waste, let's say we are writing a check to somebody for a million dollars and 96 cents, and it really should have been uh, you know, a billion dollars and sixty-nine cents, or a million dollars and sixty-nine cents. We're we're counting that as a twenty-seven cent error and not a million-dollar error in those numbers, right? I just want to make sure we really are chasing the really big dollars. Well, I I, I think the uh, the amounts that we've mentioned in our report are the are the right estimate. Okay, so that's the actual cost to the government and not the aggregate dollar amounts right. that th there is yeah. some error in. Yeah, there, there could be some error in there. And some of the uh, estimates for the Medicare and Medicaid program, for example, some of the improper payments are based upon incomplete documentation, yeah. not having enough documentation. But a lot of it is for medically unnecessary services or not or people receiving money that are not eligible. Okay. And I, I think Medicare and Medicaid is probably a ripe target. And we talk about using software. We have an ab abysmal record with IT. In, in the Federal Government. I think that comes from the fact we don't try to use off-the-shelf products. We come up with our own, uh, I'm going to use the word ridiculous, uh, specifications rather than trying to squeeze something into an existing product. I realize you know, balancing the Federal budget isn't like going out and buying World of Warcraft at uh, Best Buy, but it seems like, for instance, in Medicare and Medicaid, there ought to be something already developed out there by the private insurance carriers who are doing pretty much the same thing. It, 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 do, you, do you see some advantage in, in doing that? And maybe I should direct this to the, uh, to the lady from IBM. I mean, is there a product? I mean, can we just go plug this stuff into your Congo's product and just start working at it? Y yes. And so there is a, I mean, there is a solution. So I don't want to say it's a product. So it's a solution that exists that we have been, like I said, North Carolina. I also want to 
let you know that um, CMS has recently issued a request for proposal do, to do exactly what we're talking about, to do it before it gets paid, to leverage analytics and IT to do predictive analytics around what gets paid. All right. And I will yield back the uh, remainder of my time with just uh, the comment that uh, I, I really think part of what we need to be doing is looking for off-the-shelf solutions we can, uh, we can plug into rather than trying to uh, develop something custom for ourselves. That always tends to be much more expensive. Thank you. Would the gentleman yield? Sure. Uh, Mr. Dodaro, one quick question. We haven't asked you to, to talk about the, uh, the cyber threat of both dollar waste and failure. Could you comment on that for a moment for all of us? There are a, lot of, a lot of people are just getting up to speed on that. Yeah, uh, th this is a very important issue. I'm glad you asked me that question. I mean, we put uh, computer security across the Federal Government as a high-risk area in 1997 because of concerns that we had. It was the very first time we designated something across the whole Federal Government as high risk. And the risk continued to escalate. And the Federal agencies do not have good comprehensive systems with access control, segregation of duties, comprehensive security programs. In 2003, we expanded it to critical infrastructure protection, the energy grid and other areas. And the incidents that are occurring and are reported or going higher, the Federal Government needs to have a better public-private partnership with the private sector, since most of the assets are in the private sector. There needs to be more early warning and detection capabilities. This is a very important area. I was glad to see that the President commissioned the study, but our review of the study shows that of the 24 recommendations, only two have been fully implemented to date. So there is a, a road map, clear roles and responsibilities, partnership with the private sector. This is a terribly important area, and we are concerned about it. Thank you. Does the gentleman yield back? I do. The gentleman from New York is recognized, Mr. Yarmuth. You got me in the wrong state. That's okay. It's I'm, I'm sorry. Kentucky, we, not, New, not New York. I'm sorry. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. That's right. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry, uh, Kentucky. They, write, know, they write it like down and I read it. I apologize, Kentucky. East, I know everything east of California is all messed up, but that's all. No, <laughs> but you know, you know, they, uh, Mr. Kucinich often reminds me I was from Cleveland before I was from California. Mm, but right. the gentleman from Kentucky. That's good. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, thank you all for your testimony, Mr. Dodaro. I wanted to talk with you about the. One of the categories that you've added to the the high risk uh, list, and that's the uh, revenues from oil and gas leases. Um, according to your report, that is actually one of the largest income so non-tax income sources of the government, about nine billion dollars in in 2009. And uh, just a couple of days ago, you wrote in the op -ed, an op-ed in the New York Times. And you wrote, in fiscal years 2006 and 2007, we found that much of the data reported by oil and gas companies appeared erroneous, resulting in millions in uncollected fees. Uh, do you have any sense of how long the oil and gas companies have been misreporting their um, uh, production? I'm not sure offhand you know, how far back that goes. We did update that work in, in 2009 and found still continued data inaccuracies in the system. We also looked at Interior's efforts recently uh, to verify the production numbers of oil and gas production and found problems with that as well. Uh, the other point I would add on this is that the uh, assessment system generally hasn't been looked at in the last 25 years, and we had made recommendations there because when the Federal Government was compared to other countries and even some states, it was relatively low in terms of what it was charging. Interior has a study underway, and they are due to produce it this year. Do you have any estimate of how much this may have cost uh, the taxpayers? Uh, not reporting? offhand. Not offhand. Uh, in your examination of the data from 2006 and 2007, what company did you find to have underreported and underpaid the most? I am not sure. I would have to provide that for the record if we have it. I would be happy okay. to do so. I would like to make a request that, that you would do that and provide a list of the companies that uh, have underreported and therefore underpaid. Uh, I appreciate that. Mr. Frakes, I want to just ask you a question. You made a comment about um, the uh, amount of medical services provided basically for, as defensive medicine, and, and I think you mentioned the number 25 percent. Possibly. Yes, that's correct. Where did that number come from? It came from a study that was conducted between Jackson Healthcare and the Gallup organization. 
And there are, there are studies that show that that number is considerably lower than that, isn't it? I mean, I think we all agree that there's a lot of service being provided that's probably unjustified, but attributing it to, to medical malpractice, there are numbers that are considerably lower than that, aren't there? We yeah well, I guess what we're going off is is that study and it's it was a it was a uh, the interesting thing about that study was the fact that it was done in private it was it was something that was anonymous so that the physicians felt compelled to answer under the you know under anonymity and so they were they were given that cloak and so um, we like we like to think that that number is the, is the most accurate number given that I've had doctors stand up in front of a room full of people and admit that they practice defensive mm -hmm. medicine which is also a, is uh, potentially admitting Medicare fraud <laughs> as, as well but they do it anyway. Uh, but to pursue that question just a little bit further, would ending the fee-for-service compensation system deal with that issue, uh, medically unnecessary procedures, and so forth, would that help contribute to uh, reducing that number as well? It certainly would in the sense that uh, providers would feel the need to to move toward more towards an outcome-based system, and that's something that we at the center talk a lot about, and that is I, that idea of as you increase the incentives for outcomes for physicians, the not only does the cost go down, but the care goes up, and physicians also would not feel the need as much to, to practice that level of defensive medicine, certainly. Yeah. Uh, one question, and this is just purely informational, Ms. Kammer, on, on the issue of, of the payments going out the door, uh, stopping the payments before they go, they go out the door. One of the complaints that I hear consistently, I'm sure we all do from medical providers, doctors, hospitals, and so forth, is that they wait a long time for their money to begin with, and because of the, their, their assessment, their characterization of being uh, dealing with very low profit margins anyway, that the, the wait of 90 days or 120 days uh, is already stretching them, how, pressuring them. How much more delay or would there be more delay based on the kind of the theory of, of uh, approaching payments that you, you've uh, given us? You know, we're at the point now through you know, leveraging technology to do predictive analytics that you could get closer to real time reviews of those. So you could really speed it up. You could speed it up. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. The gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Mr. Rigi, am I saying it right? Okay. I was really intrigued by what you talked about, and you seem to uh, have a, a really direct response to what's going on. Now, the President the other day was talking about all this capital that's sitting on the sidelines and businesses aren't investing it, and which leads to the, uh, the, 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 the premise that the only way to get out of this situation is for the government to borrow more money and spend more money. Could you expand a little bit on that? Because as a guy right now, I am an automobile dealer, and I have been encouraged to, to build another building, and, and, and at the point that I have, it is very difficult to borrow money from banks right now for, for small business people. So while this money is sitting on the sideline, please give me an idea of the, this philosophy that the government has to just keep borrowing and borrowing and borrowing money to get us out of this dilemma. If you could just expand a little bit on your comments, because I, I think you are you're, you're hitting right where we need to hear this information. Thank you. Um, it is a great question. I think I would like to remember or remind people that the Federal government has already done this, borrow a lot of money and pretended to invest in our economy to jump start it, and it has not worked. Um, this money on the sideline is a real direct product of all the uncertainty that is inserted into an economy when the federal government spends massive amount because individuals and entrepreneurs are pretty rational and they understand that spending today or borrowing today means taxes tomorrow. Um, I mean, I also, there were a lot of you know, new regulations going in, so it induced a lot of uncertainty. And that is what this money on the sideline is. It is like, why am I going to actually invest money today, hire people when I don't know what is going to happen? I don't know whether I am going to have customers. So I, I think, I mean, the uncertainty is the key to everything. And the more the government does what created the uncertainty, the more uncertainty we will have and the less we will recover. Okay. Well, let me ask you, now, this $814 billion stimulus bill, uh, and we describe it as waste, it, were, are there any parts of that that you thought were worthwhile? I mean, I think it was uh, uh, the part about, like, unemployment benefits, I think. You know, it's uh, as a society pretty wealthy. We can afford to uh, to uh, to help people who are deeply in need to some extent. However, I mean, the economic literature was very clear. This was not going to work because um, 
well, the government invests money, the money has to come from somewhere. There are no magical source for federal funds. It has to be taken from the economy, and it doesn't have the return on investment that the administration claimed it was going to have. Yeah. In, in a, I mean, the, the, whole, the whole drive was to spend this money, because if we didn't spend it, we are going to see unemployment rise above 8 percent, and then, so it goes to 10 percent. Now, let me ask you, at some point, people knew this wasn't working. Where, where, where could we have said, hey, wait, wait a minute, this is crazy. What are we doing? We are throwing a lot of money out there. We haven't spent it all yet. But then there was this mad rush to spend a lot of money because we said it was going to work, and we continue to see that it is not working, and we are following this Judas goat and saying, yeah, just spend more. We are going to be okay. Borrow more, spend more. At some point, it is going to break for us. Now, at some point, it is going to break, but I don't think it is going to break the right way. It is going to break truly in the sense it is going to break. I, I agree with you. I actually would have argued that it was a bad idea to do it in the first place. And there was a lot of evidence. It hasn't worked in the 30s. It hasn't worked in the 70s. And it hasn't worked now. The other thing is, like, it's not only spending in the form of this stimulus bill. It's all the spending that took place in the last 10 years, in the last 20 years, in the last 30 years, right? I mean, there's been a lot of spending. If it worked, we wouldn't be in this mess in the first place. And I think we need to change paths. And, and we are talking about waste, and we need to realize that waste doesn't just come in the form of overpayments and earmarks. It also comes in the form of the vet federal government put its, putting its finger everywhere in the private sector where it shouldn't be to prop companies that are failing, which is a drag on the economy, this, this propping up those companies, or to give money to companies who are actually succeeding, which is totally useless, um, like when the federal government gives money to the states and when it shouldn't be. This creates waste. We need to change paths and start thinking directly about what wasting government spending means. And I appreciate your testimony. I wish we had more time, but I got to tell you, when you add the federal uh, government uh, and then the, the state and local governments, when we start to talk about how we are attacking our GDP and the amount of money that we are wasting through government, it is way over the top. So thank you for being here today. I really appreciate your thank comments. Thank you. I yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We now recognize. Uh, are you ready? The gentleman from Cleveland, Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Over the past few days, members of this House have voted on amendments to the CR which will severely cut or entirely eliminate government entities or programs which provide critical assistance to the most vulnerable Americans. Some amendments which have already passed eliminate funding for research on some of our nation's most consistently pressing social and economic issues. To my knowledge, none of these existing programs appeared on the GAO's list of government programs at high risk of waste, fraud, and abuse. In the meantime, numerous Department of Defense initiatives, and specifically DOD contracting, rank prominently in the GAO high risk report as programs that remain very susceptible to fraud and abuse. The report states that there are, quote, significant ongoing problems, unquote, and, quote, persistently poor program outcomes, unquote in the Department of Defense's inability to perform detailed audits of major defense acquisition programs. It notes that for fiscal year 2009, for example, the DOD obligated $372 billion in contracts for goods and services, and yet that the contracting is hampered by, quote, the lack of well-defined requirements, the use of ill-suited business arrangements, and a lack of an adequate number of trained acquisition and contract oversight personnel, unquote. I have a copy of a letter sent in November of last year by eight individuals who represent more than 300 years of experience with the Defense, Defense Department budget, weapons, and military operations. And, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that a copy of the letter be entered into the Without record. objection, so ordered. Thank you. This letter was sent to Erskine Bowles, the co-chairman of the President's National Commission on Fiscal Responsibility and Reform. These eight individuals implored Chairman Bowles to take the opportunity to make reform of the Defense Department budget a centerpiece of their effort to create a model for de deficit reduction. Quote, the Pentagon cannot track the money it spends. Routinely, DOD does not know if it is paid contractors once, twice, or not at all. We recently learned it does not even know how many contractors it has, how many they employ, and what they are doing. Unquote. In sharp contrast to almost every other Federal agency, the Pentagon has failed to comply with the Chief Financial Officers Act of uh, 1990, which sought to solve this problem by requiring the Pentagon and other Federal agencies to pass annual audits of the links between their expenditures and legally enacted appropriations authorizing these expenditures. So, Comptroller General Dodaro, can Congress be sure that budget requests from the Pentagon reflect the Department of Defense's actual costs? 
the uh, as you mentioned, the, the, uh, there has been an inability to have the uh, books of the Pentagon, aside from the Army Corps of Engineers and the well, military Well, let's talk health. about everything yeah, else right. except the Corps. Right. Uh, they, they've not been able to pass a test of an audit, so it's not clear. Uh, you know, there's accurate accounting of what the expenditures. Isn't it true that you'd have to be able to audit them to know if their costs roughly match up with their request? It, it would be uh, important to have that information as adequate assurance that, right. that, that, that the costs were there. Yes. So, so if we don't have accurate tracking of DOD payments to its contractors, much less uh, how those contractors spent those monies, is it even possible to know? if the DOD budget request is being lost to waste, fraud, or other abuse? Well, there would be a degree of uncertainty that you wouldn't necessarily want to have uh, in making those kind of judgments. But, you know, but basically uh, the allocations that are made are, are tracked through budgetary systems that aren't audited either. And I would note that the Department is first now starting to audit the budget numbers uh, that uh, that are allocated against the cost, and I think that's a good step and a step in the right direction, and should eventually provide the type of assurance that you're looking for. When I first came to Congress, I was told that the Department of Defense had over 1,100 accounting systems, individual accounting systems, and uh, systems, and also uh, that they had over a trillion dollars in accounts that they could not track or reconcile. Uh, I, I just, I just, uh, I'm hopeful that uh, those who have the responsibility for oversight of the auditing part will uh, pay attention to that and hope that you take that message back as well. Uh, I will do that. In fact, uh, of the main reasons we can't provide an opinion on the audited consolidated financial statements of the U.S. government is because of the Department of Defense pervasive financial management practices and, and procedures. And so we have been trying to work with them. They have got some short-term priorities now to focus on auditing the budget numbers and asset accountability issues, which I think is a good starting point. They have a long way to go. Well, I am I'm hopeful, Mr. Chairman, that uh, this committee, as part of its oversight responsibilities, will have the opportunity to go deeply into uh, some of these questions related to the Department of Defense's uh, spending. Thank would you. the gentleman yield? I certainly would. I might share with you, when I was in the Army, they, uh, during that period of time, they, uh, they decided they would find out how many rail cars they had, so they did an audit and came up with about 25 percent of them missing. Then they did a walk-down audit and found how many had been repainted over the years to company names because they, they didn't have to explain to the Army or you know, the military that they were missing, but there would be hell to pay if they lost one belonging to a company. So this is not a new problem. I look forward to working with you on solving this long-term problem of a lack of accountability at DOD. I, I, I want to thank the gentleman and, and hope that his remarks uh, do, not, do not imply a uh, f uh, favoring of privatization of the Army. <laughs> no, but I would like to know if those rail cars have all been found. <laughs> <laughs> with that, we recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Ross, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Dodaro, uh, thank you for being here very much. I, I, I note that last year Congress, when they were raising the debt ceiling, empowered the um, GAO office for a report as to the duplication of any yes. um, uh, activities or, 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 or efforts of the, the Federal Government that might be cost savings, and that that report is, is forthcoming? Yes. Can, can you give us a preliminary or, or like a little trailer or sneak preview of what we might anticipate? Well, what we have identified about 34 uh, different areas of overlap and duplication for consideration by the Congress. And they touch several hundred programs in virtually all Federal departments and agencies. Now, we also, as an added bonus, are including in the report uh, about another 50 cost savings opportunities for the Congress to consider, and also uh, revenue enhancements, where there there's abilities to tackle what is now an estimated tax gap between taxes owed and collected of about $290 billion. So uh, could you quantify maybe how much we are looking at in terms of duplication and, and, there, and there's, at, there's, at this point? We don't have, because of, and we will discuss in the report some limitations, on, as, as Congressman Kucinich just talked about, some of the cost data and the baseline information isn't really there. So it is hard to, to come up with an overall quantification effort, but it will be billions of dollars. It is significant. 
Uh, I know we've got limited time here, so this is going to be an interesting question. I would love for you to answer, if you could, in the brief time that I have here. In your report on high-risk lists, you indicate strengthening the foundation for efficiency and effectiveness. One of your request, uh, recommendations is restructuring the U.S. Postal Service to achieve sustainable financial viability. How? Well, basically, <laughs> they have to change their business model, the business it, it, model they have. And we, we've outlined options in, in the report there for the Postal Service to consider and, and for the Congress as well. And, and in that business model, I mean, you've got 150 million households that are being reached every day, six days a week so far, uh, by the U.S. Postal Service, uh, but you've got 80 percent of their cost is for compensation and benefits. I mean, are you suggesting then we look at both sides of the equation, not only the revenue side of the equation, but also the, the expense side of the equation? I, I think everything has to be on the table there to, to really restructure it. Uh, you know, we are looking at facilities. We just put out a report this week talking about how other countries have tackled this problem and reduced their facilities, changed their retail, uh, retail options, changed personnel uh, structures. So I think all, all things have to be considered. Okay. Um, Ms. Kammer. I, and I've, I've, I've got to ask you this question while I'm on the Postal Service because of your background, uh, not only in the, the, the public sector, but also in the private sector as a consultant uh, with IBM. Uh, again, you've got an understanding of marketing channels. You've got an understanding of public-private relationships. Uh, would you have any recommendations for the U.S. Postal Service as to how they can be more cost efficient, cost effective, uh, more technologically advanced? Yeah, um so we have a team of consultants that are working with the Postal Service today, and I would be happy to get back to you with some of the recommendations that they have offered. That would be great. Thank you. Um, Dr. Derugi, uh, quick question, because I am a firm believer that government shouldn't be in the business of business, that, that essential government functions are what government should provide, and that we don't need to not only be a competitor in the market, but also be the regulator of that same market. So uh, I have got some concerns that that I think run deep with, with, with your philosophies and your report. But I want to talk to you specifically about project labor agreements. Uh, are you familiar with project labor agreements that where PLAs, where the, um, uh, any uh, government contract that is negotiated has to be done at a prevailing wage or union wage? And in most cases, we have seen a situation where non-union uh, contractors uh, don't get the contract because they are not capable of paying the union wages, and therefore you are seeing um, uh, union jobs being let out when it, competitively it may be better to go to the lowest bidder. Uh, do you have any comments on that? Have you had any experience in working with project labor agreements? No, I, I have not. I'm Mr. Sorry. Frakes, how about you? Have... No. Okay. Yeah. But I, I think that it is something that obviously is crowding out the market and something that you know, would be a good thing to investigate. Uh, one last thing, back to uh, Mr. Dodaro. Uh, you talk about the, the excess of real property that we have. Do you have any recommendations for liquidation uh, of those uh, or, or leasing of those to at least enhance the revenue side of the, the budget, the U.S. budget? Not uh, facility by facility. We think the agencies need to do that. We have pushed OMB to come up with a plan. Uh, also, there are uh, rules in the budget process that complicate the lease versus buy decision, which we have recommended that, that those be dealt with as well. You know, we think this is basically a management responsibility to decide that. But it that, should be done. It I mean, should be done. And that's, wasted resource. Yes, yeah, it definitely, definitely. Okay. Thank you. I see my time's up. I thank the gentleman. The gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney, for thank five you, minutes. Mr. Chairman, well, thank the members of the panel very much for your testimony here today. Uh, you know, this committee has conducted a lot of oversight uh, about the Department of Defense's contingency contracting, both in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, including the use of private security contractors, but not exclusively them, of course. Last year, in fact, when I was chairing the subcommittee on national security and foreign policy, we uncovered evidence of a trucking contractors who were paying warlords and insurgents billions of dollars for so-called protection. And we also uh, talked to another contract where $3 billion in fuel contracts were going to companies that the State Department and the Department of Defense knew nothing about. So my question to you, uh, Sir uh, Dodero, is, you know, do you think that we have to have some improvements in the contracting laws that will provide those authorities that may be necessary to meet the challenges for operating in contingency conflicts? I, I definitely think there are lessons learned that need to be applied both in, in potentially in law but also in practice, uh, and that there's a lot of lessons learned about the putting uh, this type of responsibility in, in a theater uh, without appropriate training and support 
uh, that needs to be done to adequately oversee it. So, yes, I, I agree with you that there is probably lessons learned, and we can provide some of our thoughts on that to you. That would be excellent if you would. We would appreciate that. You know, also, with particular concern on the private security contractors, uh, you know, there has been a real persistent problem with how they are managed in both of those areas, Iraq and Afghanistan, of course. And last year, CENTCOM uh, got a task force together to figure out how many private security contractors they actually employed in Afghanistan, uh, and a number came into tens of thousands on that. Uh, in Iraq, the State Department is about to take on a lot of the responsibilities from the Department of Defense, uh, and they are hiring additional private security contractors on that. So how much confidence should we have that as DOD transitions to the State Department in this area that they are going to be able to oversee effectively all of those thousands of private security contractors that they are bringing on? Well, that is an area that I think needs, needs some focus. I believe we have uh, work underway in that area to assess that and be happy to provide a briefing to you. Okay. How far along are you in that work, sir? I am not er, early on. Right. Well, it is a pretty immediate situation, yeah, right. so I hope we are going to expedite that a bit and, and be able to move that forward, because we have had hearings on that regularly throughout, and we haven't seen a beginning too far along on okay. examining, and I say we, I am not meaning your yeah, agency, right. but State Department and uh, and the Department of Defense right. talk about it. They know yeah. there is a problem, but we are not really there yet. Your work would be very helpful on that. Uh, the other problem that we have, of course, is we don't seem to have enough people to really oversee those contractors that we do uh, put it out to. And that has been a real serious problem in USAID, the State mm -hmm. Department, uh, and other places on that. The Wartime Contracting Commission that Jim Leach and I had the legislation on, they finally got out and started doing their job. Uh, they found out that we were hiring private contractors to oversee other private contractors on that. So how do you assess the Department of Defense's progress in insourcing those critical roles of oversight and management of contracts? Yeah, our, our assessment is the contracting decisions are made much too often on an ad hoc basis. There really isn't a, a, a systematic assessment of what should be contracted out, what should be insourced, and for what should be insourced, how you build your capabilities and your, and your staffing and expertise to be able to do that, what expertise do you need to oversee the contractor. So we have encouraged and recommended systematic assessments of that. That is the only way you can deal with that issue over time. Yeah, well, we have some serious issues. As we started yeah. to analyze that, do you have any ideas for how they might ramp that up and separate those out so that those inherently governmental functions of oversight of contractors can actually be brought back in or insourced? Is there uh, an impediment that exists that you can recognize and do something about, or do you think that this analysis is going to have to just wind its way out before we really get some effective recourse? Well, I think it all has to start with, you know, what mission do you want to really achieve there and what's your best way to be able to do it? I don't, I don't think there's going to be a magic solution to, to, to that, that there's going to be a set of rules on this and that, uh, particularly when you get into environments when you are in contingency operations and planning, you need to have something that is a little bit more robust as a foundation, but then you need to be able to allow some flexibility to be put in place. But you have to have proper oversight over it, Congressman. I, and that is where I think things break down. Well, we even started on the Blue Water Program with the Coast Guard, you know, where they had uh, large you know, ships being, being made or anything like that. We had a contractor out there doing the different components. Then we had a contractor mm -hmm. analyzing the job. We had them managing the job. We had them overseeing the job. And then when the job got all messed up, we almost hired the same people to come in and assess how we could fix it. Yeah. No, it, 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 government needs, for those areas that you know you are going to contract out, you need the proper people to oversee it that are government employees to be able to make sure you got the duty of loyalty uh, and you have the expertise and continuity to oversee it in the best interest of the government and the taxpayer. So getting a grip on not outsourcing jobs that shouldn't be outsourced and the ones that should be outsourced, making sure we can manage them properly, I agree with you, is a serious issue for us. Yes, it is. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Wahlberg, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you to the panel for being here. Uh, it has been enlightening, uh, at least the portions that I have been in. I wish I could have been here for the entire time. Uh, Mr. Dodaro, uh, in your written testimony, you state that uh, excess or underutilized buildings cost over $1.6 billion annually to operate. Um, I guess the question I would flow from Mr. Ross's earlier was what has prevented the Federal Government from doing something that makes so much sense, uh, such as selling the properties. Uh, you, you stated that you wouldn't pick the properties, but what's kept us from doing that? 
There are, there are certain barriers that we have uh, recommended that OMB focus on. For example, there are a lot of stakeholder interests uh, in, in, in some of these buildings and, and properties that need to be dealt with to be able to do it. There are some legal requirements that are in place. But none of these barriers are insurmountable. And uh, our point is that you need to aggressively identify them. They are different for each uh, property, as you might imagine, but they need to be dealt with on a more concerted, aggressive basis. What is the hesitancy toward the, this aggressive action yeah, I, from not, your perspective? Yeah, to, to be honest with you, I am not quite sure, other than it takes a lot of hard work and effort uh, to, to be able to go forward on, on these initiatives. Uh, we have been pushing uh, for plans to be developed to be able to do that. Uh, we are pleased they are getting better data, and they are also, uh, you know, on w what the situation is like, but actually, you know, implementing a lot of these things appears to be more difficult. I am not, uh, to be honest with you, I am not quite sure exactly what the reason is. Any, cons uh, well, any concern about any impropriety uh, in stakeholder issues um, that go beyond simply dragging feet or um, arguments that we don't have the resources or time or energy? Uh, I mean, is there anything that would go beyond that to something? In yeah, it's not nothing. Uh, I, I'll go back and check with our team, make sure that my answer is correct on this. And if we, if there are any things of that nature, we'll provide them to you. But in some cases, uh, like for example, there are some historic preservation issues that need to be dealt with with some of these buildings, uh, and other, uh, you know, uh, uh, legal concerns. But I'll, I'll provide a listing to you of some of the barriers, and also if there are any improprieties, I we will certainly let you know. Thank you. Um, Dr. DeRuji, um, I am tempted to just say my question is, how would you expand on your statement already? But I won't do that. Uh, maybe the question will allow that to take place. I appreciate uh, what you had to say. Um, in your written submission, you identify three areas of Federal spending that uh, should be addressed, one being Federal spending on functions that should be reserved for the States. Uh, two, Federal spending on functions that should be reserved for the private sector, and three, Federal spending on items and, or services that government has no business purchasing in the first place. Uh, I would like to focus my question mostly on this uh, first area. Uh, it is apparent that you uh, strongly believe in the Tenth Amendment reserving powers of the States not enumerated to the Federal government. Um, I do. Then do you believe a reevaluation and likely a limitation of the grants the Federal Government makes is the best way to reorganize Federal priorities, or does Congress need to do something more explicit, and if so, what is it? I mean, I can't, I can't talk to the legal aspect because I'm not a lawyer, I'm an economist, and so I will go to, uh, to the money. I really do think that restructuring um, the money that goes to the States, either by cutting it off or actually turning a lot of it into block grants instead of matching grants, we, which uh, induce inefficiency, promotes overspending, um, and it would be a good way to do it. First, it would um, allow states to kind of like have time to think about how they are going to be providing this service. And one of the problems with the, with the matching system that we have now, above the fact, I mean, on top of the fact that it, it induces overspending, as I have said, is the fact that um, it's a one size fit all type of thing. When you have a grant from the Federal Government, it also comes with strings attached and, and things that you have to do in a certain way, and that doesn't take under consideration you know, the specificity of the state. So that would be like the first step. I would either you know, cut a lot of this money off or turn the rest into block grants. So cutting it off, you're not concerned that the, the job can't be done then? I say that facetiously. Yeah. No, I mean, it's like there's always this understanding that this, this belief that if the federal government doesn't do it, it won't happen. But it's just not true. And, and the, the states are already, for instance, education. I mean, most of the spending already comes from the states. And it is a state function or a private sector function. And if the, the states don't get this money, then they will be thinking about what they actually truly need to do. And maybe a lot of these functions that they are providing right now, they should turn to the private sector. So no, I'm not concerned. Thank you very much. I thank the gentleman. We now recognize the gentlelady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Norton, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dodaro, uh, I'd like to ask you a question that is, I'm sure, perplexed uh, um, members of this committee, um, and certainly the public. 
It has to do with very large, sometimes huge contractors whose uh, abuses or um, poor performance uh, is so severe that they are brought before this committee or their headlines on them. Let, uh, and I want to know, <laughs> uh, I want to describe um, uh, the uh, response of federal agencies in awarding them contracts again. For example, if you did some, if you did the functional equivalent of what some of these contractors uh, have done as a as a employee, uh, you'd be out the door and nobody would ever hire you again <laughs> in the field, it would seem. But let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, uh, KBR, uh, doing work in Iraq um, for the Department of Defense, uh, so faulty on uh, the maintenance of electrical equivalents, uh, equi equipment that um, deaths resulted, including uh, dozens of deaths of uh, Amer American soldiers. But DOD then awards a KBR a $2.8 billion contract to provide uh, support services, additional support services for our, for our troops in, in Iraq. Or let's take the most notorious, perhaps, Blackwater. Um, and private security, because that's been a, a headline, a headliner. Um, uh, that that they they still have major um, um, the State Department after those headlines uh, awarded them uh, contracts for protective services in Afghanistan. Now these people were seen as having themselves committed, perhaps some, or at least accused of committing committing. Um, uh, what, what would amount to uh, in prosecution uh, crimes uh, while they are uh, doing their work. Uh, is the, 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 does DOD and, and, and in the case of Blackwater uh, give contracts again to such companies because of the difficulty of startup? Is it too wasteful? To, this is, after all, a competitive process. Uh, why in the world, if a contractor has exposed the, the agency to such embarrassment and infamy, would the agency want to give that contractor, again, there must be some inherent reason uh, for, for, for doing so? Yeah. T typically, uh, what we find when there is lack of competition, there are either re re reasons for expediency, they need to move very quickly in an area. They need to have people who have the uh, proper background, and, you know, security clearances, that type of thing, or there's limited numbers of companies that could provide that service. But what we focused on is making sure there is more competition in, in the process. It's a better value to the government. There needs to be uh, adequate consideration of past contractor performance in the process. There are safeguards built into the process through suspension and debarment that need to be put into place and then followed adequately uh, through through the process. So we're is the suspension and debarment used? Uh, it, it's used, but I, I think our work has shown that it's not always the properly checked before some of the awards are made on a cross-government kind of basis. But is I, there a way to I'll structure the, the the contract up front, for example, so that if if uh, uh, wastes and and um, such as the or, or or worse, failure to maintain the electrical system in Iraq occurs. Somehow you owe the government rather than the government continuing to owe you. Well, you definitely need to have provisions in there to protect the government from non-performance on the on the contract. What kind of provisions as, as protect well. protect them now? I, I'd have to go back and look in the in the and to provide some some uh, explanations. What we did find, though, and 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 this is being addressed, is that many times there are incentive. Uh, awards and fees there that contractors were being paid in the incentive fee and really weren't meeting the standards of performance as what you would think they should be. But I'll go back, I'll provide to you and this committee the, the standard provisions that are in there. It does seem to me that a, a, a system of uh, rewards, I love incentives, frankly, of, of rewards and penalties, carrots and sticks, uh, have always been, been uh, uh, thought to work. Thank yep. you very much. Yeah, uh, just for the uh, record, uh, we are doing work currently on suspension and debarment practices, which we'll be happy to share with this uh, committee as that work is being completed 
uh, and that we will provide you the uh, Federal Acquisition Regulations that protect the, the uh, government. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentlelady. We now recognize the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Gowdy, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it is impossible for me to explain to the folks I work for, and I suspect most of my colleagues would have similar difficulty explaining to the people we work for the pervasiveness and longevity of government waste, fraud, and abuse. And I commend you for gathering with us today to seek solutions. And I want to start with the one that I find most compelling, uh, which would be criminal consequences. Uh, do you have an estimate, and I will throw this open to all four of you, an estimate, negligence, gross negligence, criminal negligence. Uh, where is the preponderance of the waste, fraud, and abuse? Where does it fall in that paradigm? Not all at once. I can, uh, I can tell you from, uh, from the Medicare and Medicaid side, um, a lot of what happens in terms of, of the prosecution of fraudulent claims uh, within CMS, unfortunately, does not occur until it meets a certain threshold of money. So uh, a lot who's, of these claims Whose threshold is that? I'm sorry? Who's who sets the threshold? It's within CMS, um, and they're the ones who determine, based on their allocation of resources, what claims that they can go after. Well, let me and ask you about the allocation of resources, because if, if, if my numbers are correct, there are almost 50 different investigative agencies, in quotes, that are, that are seeking waste, fraud, and abuse just within health care. That alone is an example of waste and fraud and abuse. Fifty different agencies? And a huge irony that, that exists within that, and it's an excellent point, is that there is waste that's going on between all those organizations in the sense that there is a lack of data sharing that's going on between them. Uh, so, for instance, even within, let's say, Medicare Part A and Part D, you are missing uh, data sharing between those two that they would be able to use to identify who potential crooks are. And so, as a result, they are losing out on being able to cross-reference these individuals, and some of these people might actually be claiming to be legitimate suppliers for Medicare Part A when they were already uh, identified as a, as a potential fraudulent supplier for Part D. And so that lack of, of interaction, that lack of sharing, is leading to a lot of the, of the negligence that you are speaking of. Well, it is also inexplicable. It is impossible to understand, uh, to explain to anybody outside um, this zip code. Um, how you can have that. And with respect to the question asked by my colleague from the District of Columbia about carrots and sticks, I prefer the sticks. So tell me what is being done with respect to criminal prosecution consequences uh, to ameliorate what has been, a, if my numbers are accurate, a two-decade-long acknowledged problem. How many, how many investigations have been started? How many matters? How many declinations by the U.S. Attorney's Office? There, we can uh, provide that information to you for the record. There are reports that the Inspector General has put out that show the matters referred, how many have been investigated and the prosecutions and, and that have been prosecuted as well. So we can, we can provide that information to you. And the, the thresholds typically are set by the, uh, the Justice Department in terms of how much monetary money would have to be, uh, uh, you know, sort of broached before they would uh, Phil would be uh, efficient and productive to go through the judicial system in, in that uh, process. But th those, those figures are available. We will provide them to you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I would yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. Would the gentleman yield for just yes, a moment? Uh, in the case of, of the question of, of prosecution, is the biggest problem the lack of prosecution from your studies? Or is it the lack of catching in real time these individuals before the money is taken? Which, which do you think leads to more of the long-term abuse, the fact that people can, can continue stealing again and again uh, in various ways, or the fact that we don't prosecute them at a low enough level? Um, I, while we, we haven't studied that uh, issue directly, Mr. Chairman, uh, I, I think part of the, the, uh, the issue uh, is that there's it's it's uh, not that uh, you can't you can continue to ab abuse the system with low potential gain caught. So I I think that that just intuitively just to tell you yeah. from that standpoint I'll be happy I'll go back and take a look and see if we have a more definitive. Okay, act. and one one follow up question on an earlier one: Wouldn't it be impossible for the government to contract directly with everyone? Meaning 
at some point the government does have to rely on general contractors to do jobs. Thus, it is inevitable that you will have a contractor hiring other contractors. Yeah, it, as long as it is in a, in a typical prime contract, subcontractor mode, I think that is fine. But when the, when the government uh, contracts out its responsibility to oversee the prime contract, then I think you have an issue. Which we all agree with. We now recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Speer, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am um, very pleased with this hearing and, frankly, think that if we spent um, the rest of this year just dealing with the issues that were raised here and actually got some results, we would have done our job. Uh, I have much frustration with the fact that we hold hearings, we uncover problems, and then nothing happens. Um, to you, Comptroller, uh, congratulations on your official appointment. Um, you have a high-risk list. There are agencies that stay on this high-risk list year after year with no penalties, no results, no changes. And I think that that is inexcusable. And if you need to have more authority to force these agencies to do what you recommend, then we should introduce legislation to make sure that that happens. Because we look foolish, and the American people look at us as if um, we are totally ineffective when we cannot deliver once we have uncovered a problem. Uh, let me move on to an area that you just editorialized in the New York Times about just um, two days ago. Uh, a percentage of the proceeds from uh, gas and oil companies that drill on Federal lands are, are supposed to be paid. Um, and evidently, according to a report, uh, there are substantial funds that could be generated, some $9 billion in fiscal year 2009. But it appears that it is on your high risk list in part because the oil and gas companies aren't paying their proper share. Um, so I guess my question is, how long have they been underreporting? Why do we allow them to underreport? Why aren't the taxpayers getting the proper payments that they should be receiving because the drilling is going on on Federal lands? Basically, I I had agreed as a result of earlier question to go back and provide a listing of the uh, underreporting uh, point. The, what I would say, though, there are, there are really a couple issues. One, there is too much reliance on self-reported data that needs to be checked. Secondly, we found problems with the uh, verification process that the Interior Department is supposed to use to make sure that the production figures are correct as well. Wait a minute. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. Are you telling me that the oil and gas companies are self-reporting and we are supposed to trust them? Well, there are supposed to be checks that are put in place as well. By whom? By the Interior Department. And they're are they? To, well, that is what we found some gaps in, in that and also the verification of the production numbers, which are things that we believe need to be addressed. And that is one of the reasons we are highlighting this as a high-risk area. The other reason is that the Federal Government's basic system to assess what the uh, cost would be for Federal leasing hasn't been revisited for 25 years, uh, and that when the Federal Government's, uh, you know, what it charges for leasing on Federal lands is compared to what's charged in other countries or even some states, it ranks extremely low uh, in its charges to begin with. Mr. Chairman, I, I would um, recommend that we have a hearing specifically on this issue. The taxpayers deserve to get fair market value for the leases that they provide to anyone, be they um, the, the next door neighbor or an oil and gas company. And I think we should be getting what is justifiably um, ours. We are the stewards of the taxpayers' money, and I think this is a, a ripe area. I would like to move very quickly to the um, Alaska Native Corporation. I don't know if you have looked into it. If you have not, I would request through the committee that you do so. The Washington Post did a piece on November 26, which is astonishing to me. Um, anytime you allow for sole contracts, sole source contracts, um, there is mischief that is going to take place. And in this case, evidently, um, a contract for $250 million was offered to a subsidiary of the Alaska Native Corporation, a gentleman living in Delaware. His office was his colonial um, four-bedroom home. And he was providing uh, sexual assault and harassment training. 
except he had no experience doing that, and his last contract with the government was for $73,000, and it was for janitorial services. There's been $29 billion provided to the ANC over the last decade, um, most of the money not going to the natives, most of them going to the non-natives. It is an absolute abuse of the program, and I think we should look into that as well. Yeah, we, uh, we've uh, issued reports in the past on that with recommendations. We're currently looking at it again, and we'd be happy to share. Okay, the, that's the my problem. Then. You issue reports, nothing happens, and then there's another story written because we haven't done anything about it. I want to be part of a committee this year that actually delivers on results, not just have a bunch of hearings, but show that we are saving the American taxpayers money, and I yield back. Gentlemen, General Lady yields back. Um, uh, Chairman Issa had to uh, go to the floor, uh, several amendments that uh, he's dealing with, so I'm um, honored to step in as, uh, as the chair. Um, and I am up in the order, so it's good timing. <laughs> uh, so I will yield myself the five minutes. Uh, first, I want to thank each of you uh, for your testimony and your work on these important issues. As the uh, gentlelady just said, uh, we could spend the rest of this session just on what you are sharing with us and still not get everything done that we need to as doing good oversight. But uh, Chairman Issa has, has made a priority of just this, uh, oversight of, of how the Federal Government is handling the people's money, and uh, we are glad to have you here. Um, um, while well, I thank all of you, uh, uh, General Dodaro, I especially uh, want to thank you. I believe this is your first uh, time testifying before this committee as the uh, newly sworn in Comptroller General. Uh, our That's congratulations correct. on your uh, confirmation uh, and your 30-plus uh, years of service at GAO that brings great leadership uh, to the agency uh, with that experience. And um, I'm going to start. With, uh, with you, and uh, one is I thank you for your flexibility in our subcommittee hearing dealing with the consolidated financial reports uh, that we have moved back to uh, March 9th. Uh, look forward to, uh, to hearing your testimony then. And also to your upcoming report, uh, I believe March 1st, on duplicative Federal programs. Uh, we are anxious to see that, and I know this is a, a first-time report, although you have addressed some of those issues in other ways in the past. And uh, as chair of the subcommittee on uh, organization efficiency and financial management, we look forward very much to working with you and your staff, uh, because when we think of efficiency, uh, well, duplication of effort certainly is not an efficient use of the uh, taxpayers' funds. So, um, is there anything you want to give us a uh, primer on uh, what we may see, or should we wait till uh, March first? Well, I, I think uh, you know we were charged with uh, doing an annual report. So this will be our first annual report on this. It will uh, basically summarize the work that we have done and new work we have started since the requirement is put in place. We focused a lot on discretionary spending programs in this first uh, area, both civilian and defense. Uh, we think it is important for defense to be on the table as well, and so you will see a number of issues on that. In subsequent years, we are going to focus on mandatory spending and also tax expenditures as well. So we have got this on a three-year cycle to cover the entire Federal Government. This first report will identify 34 different areas uh, that touch hundreds of programs and virtually every major mission and agency in the, in the Federal Government. I think you will find it plenty of opportunities uh, to delve into some of these issues uh, very well. You also find that there are some limitations on the ability uh, of us to give definitive answers to the questions about how much money you will actually save if you consolidate this because of limitations on information that is collected on a reliable basis you know, from the agencies as well. We are adding uh, to that another 50 items of cost savings opportunities beyond the overlap and duplication and revenue enhancements that could be uh, uh, where revenue, additional revenue could be brought into the Federal Government to help close what is now an estimated $290 billion tax gap. Uh, so both revenue generating uh, enhancements and cost savings opportunities. So we are looking forward to you know, unveiling the report and uh, providing appropriate follow-up support to the Congress. Well, and hopefully, uh, given the timing as we are debating the uh, uh, new CR uh, today, uh, and that is still going to be an ongoing dialogue between us and the Senate, no matter what we pass today or tomorrow. Um, 
this may give us some uh, additional information as we try to really look at how to be uh, most efficient with the taxpayer funds, even in the immediate term in this current year. Mm -hmm. When you look at um, discretionary, I, I do agree that you need to look at everything, including DOD um, and, and the duplication of efforts. I assume it is more duplication of programs, but not items such as the ongoing debate on the duplication of whether we have one or two engines on the, on the Joint Strike Friday. I assume that is outside of the realm of this report. Yeah, that is that, that's correct. Okay. Um, I am going to run out of time here quick. Um, one I would add on the, uh, on the oil and gas royalty, um, and I apologize because of, of trying to multitask here if you already answered this. Is there an even a rough estimate? You know, when we see $9 billion, is, is, um, I think in 09 from these royalties, uh, you know, if they are off by even 10 percent, that is almost a, a billion dollars, 900 million. Uh, is there an estimate of what you think may be lost because of the lack of good material, uh, of, of material weaknesses in their structure? Yeah, we, we do not have an estimate at this time. Okay. And uh, one final quick comment is um, we looked forward to getting into on the financial management of DOD. When we look at discretionary spending, there is no bigger entity than DOD. And if they can't manage their finances, I mean, we know they are the best in the world at defending us and, and winning wars. But um, as uh, I know from my previous chairmanship of, this, uh, of the subcommittee, um, their financial management leaves a, a lot to be desired. So we look forward to working with you on that. Yeah, I, I do as well. And I, I look forward to the uh, hearing, upcoming hearing on the, the financial audits and to working with you in the subcommittee chair capacity. Thank you. And uh, we we'll now yield five minutes to the gentleman, uh, Mr. McHenry from North Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you for being here. I know it's been a long morning with votes. They haven't sort of uh, agreed with our schedule here. But uh, Dr. Daruji, um, and in your previous answer to Mr. Wahlberg and in your testimony, you talk about the flypaper effect, the, the fact that these Federal transfers with matching grants at the State and local level actually increases spending and over the long, long term increases taxation. Um, th this is particularly interesting in light of the stimulus. Uh, which what we had uh, $150 billion, roughly, that was in direct Federal transfers to States and thereby increasing uh, spending. So, you know, the question is, is the Federal Government really complicit in the State and municipal government's financial woes by, by these operations? Yes. It is. I mean, <laughs> will you elaborate? I mean, there, there's a lot of there's a big economic literature that actually documents this problem, and um, and and yet you know the, the 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 system goes on. One of the things that people always bemoan is the uh, the fact that if we cut federal spending going to the states, the states are going to end up with big holes. But this always rests on this assumption that the federal government has deep pockets, and it's not the case. For every dollar that the federal government um, spends, whether it is on the states, on the private sector, on uh, it has to uh, tax people, taxpayers who live in those 50 states. And also it has to borrow money. So the more the federal government does, and this is how it works, and sends money to the states, right, because it can borrow also this money, it actually pushes the federal government towards a more irresponsible behavior of so borrowing in debt. So we, it, in my subcommittee uh, on this committee, we uh, have um, we have had discussions about the muni and state bond issue, uh, the lack of real transparency there. But the, there is another issue there, right? I yes. It is the fact that the Federal Government has actually been complicit in, um, in granting special uh, treatment to investors who think it is a really good idea to lend money to bankrupt city in the form of tax deductions and, uh, I mean, Build America bond, where you actually, the Federal Government, subsidize lending money, the rates to lend money to bankrupt cities, that is complicit. Absolutely. Okay. So in terms of this, um, do you think that the State and municipal financial position is, is worse than currently known? Yes, uh, I think it is. I mean, if you take um, uh, the economic approach of, of actually valuing uh, the, pension on, the pension on funded liability, uh, instead of the less than $500 uh, billion dollars that uh, state pensions have on their book, you come up with a number of at least $3 trillion. So yes, the fiscal pictures in the states is much worse than we think. 
Okay. And in terms of, um, uh, 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 well, it, here's a separate question. I don't know if you, you'd want to answer it, but in terms of our ability to know or your ability when you're doing research to see the long-range unfunded liabilities of states, municipalities, even the federal government, is it, is it knowable for the average taxpayer uh, to see where their city or state is uh, in terms of financial liabilities over the long range? I think it's very important. I mean, not everyone wa might want to look at it, but I can tell you, I, um, I find that it's way easier to look for data at the federal level. I find it extremely complicated to look at data at the state level and municipal level. And more importantly, there are a lot of accounting standards that apply only to the government that are very different from the accounting standards that apply to the private sector that makes the size of liability of the federal government, state and municipal governments much smaller than it actually is. And it would be a very good thing not only to make these you know, these da this data transparent, but also to value it at its actual present value, and it actual so we can see what the true size of this liability is. Okay, so this is uh, GASB uh, versus FASB, in essence, uh, to 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 speak the ling lingo. But basically, the private sector has to value uh, value things differently than governments value things based on accounting standards. Yes. So you see some uh, some flaw there, with government the, the, accounting. Standards. They are they are real flaws with accounting standards. Um, I mean, and and it makes and it all points in, in one direction as making the size of the liability and what taxpayers ultimately will have to pay and the bill they'll have to burden uh, look way smaller, and that's a real problem. So FASB standards would give you greater transparency and a be better ability to under understand the true nature of the liability. Yes, and also like value uh, the liability in the future at its present value, so you know actually what you're going to have to pay in the future and what you need to actually put down right now with actual realistic rate of return rather than you know, completely optimistic 8 percent rate of return. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, just to follow on that real quick is I think you're talking a little bit about a cruel uh, method of, of, of a more accurate having the Federal Government be fully disclosing. So when we talk about our $14 trillion of debt, if we add in all of our unfunded liabilities, on Medicare and Medicaid, we're really in the 50 to 60 trillion dollars. Actually, it's currently on the the financial um, accounting, the financial statement of the United States unfunded liability reached almost 80 trillion dollars. Right. If you add right, exactly, and that's where we're we really is not well focused on because we focus on the publicly held debt, which is just a mm -hmm. small fraction of that whole cost. And one of the things also we don't talk very much about is the fact that the. Uh, uh, intra-governmental debt, which is supposed to be actually the already funded part of the promise that we've made to seniors, actually this money is gone. It is true that there are IOUs in those trust funds, but the only way the IOU are going to be cashed and paid back to these programs is if the federal government either tax people or borrow more money. Yep. Thank you. Uh, we, we thank each of you again for your testimony and, and the great resource you've provided today and, and what we know you'll continue to do. And uh, as a committee, we look forward to continuing to partner with you. Thank you. And, and we are going to move to our third panel then, um, if, uh, if our witnesses uh, want to work their way towards the witness table.
those bottles are tough to open. Thank you. On our third panel today, uh, I'd like to recognize Thomas Schatz. He is president of Citizens Against Government Waste. Uh, Mr. Andrew Moylan is Vice President of Government Affairs for the National Tax Taxpayers Union, and Mr. Gary Kalman is Director of U.S. PERG Federal Legislative Office. Uh, as you saw in the, in the previous panel, pursuant to the rules, all witnesses will be sworn if you please ra rise and raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Let the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Thank you. Please be seated. I, uh, I will tell you that we prefer to have only one main panel, uh, but we have saved the best for last, since uh, it is, it is this committee's primary duty to work with watchdog groups and groups that, and, and whistleblowers. Uh, you are among the most important people that ever come before us. So we look forward to your testimony, Mr. Schultz. Uh, Schatz, I'm sorry. Uh, please uh, uh, try to stick to five minutes, uh, and we'll have a lively round of questions afterwards. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Cummings. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today, and I have appeared before this committee regardless of who has been chairman, because we hope that we do contribute nonpartisan information about where the government can become more efficient. Uh, I am Thomas A. Schatz, President of Citizens Against Government Waste. Uh, CAGW was founded back in 1984 to build support for implementation of President Ronald Reagan's Grace Commission recommendations and other waste-cutting proposals. Uh, since then, we have helped save more than $1.08 trillion through the implementation of those recommendations. Uh, GAO's high-risk series is a valuable contribution to the effort to eliminate wasteful spending. Uh, we have long recognized the importance of this report uh, back in 1993. Uh, CAGW produced a report called Risky Business, which summarized the GAO high risk series. Uh, that was the year we also first produced Prime Cuts, a compilation of recommendations from GAO, CBO, members of Congress, and other sources. And I ask uh, that the entire Prime Cuts report be entered into the record for this hearing. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the most recent report identified 763 recommendations that would save taxpayers $350 billion in one year and $2.2 trillion over five years. Uh, CAGW has also published this week uh, critical waste issues for the 112th Congress, and there are 10 of our top recommendations in there. I also ask that this report be entered into the record. Without objection, so Thank you. Uh, that list includes reforming or eliminating outdated and inequitable agriculture subsidies, common sense ideas such as replacing the $1 bill with the $1 coin, preventing further exposure to hundreds of billions of dollars in taxpayer-funded bailouts by reforming Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and promoting innovation in the private sector by keeping the government from regulating the Internet. Uh, there are several recommendations within prime cuts that stand out more than others. Uh, the Market Access Program, for example, helps agricultural producers promote U.S. products overseas. Both President Obama and the Republican Study Committee have identified this as a source of waste. Simply put, it is corporate welfare when companies like Sunkist, which reported $860.5 million in revenues in 2009, received $2.1 million from this program to promote its products overseas. We have been looking closely at the dollar coin, and we understand that the Government Accountability Office will be issuing a new report next month on how savings can be achieved in that area. We are not quite sure that Congress will be able to score it, as we think it will save money, uh, and something that really should be a very simple decision for the United States, which is the only country that has such a low denomination for its paper currency. Uh, savings from GAO. Uh, several years ago were $500 million a year. We will see what those numbers appear to be in this uh, next report. As I mentioned, we have looked at other areas, uh, ethanol program, sugar program, dairy, peanuts, NASA constellation. And then there are programs that sound well-intentioned, 
such as the Prevention and Public Health Fund that will spend more than $14 billion over the next 10 years under the health care law on anti-obesity anti and tobacco control. Uh, in other words, the government will be using tax dollars to try to modify individual behavior. Uh, we have seen this work not so well in the Office of National Drug Control Policy with anti-drug ads, and we hope that this committee will look at this not just for whether or not it is effective, but also whether some of the grantees are using this money to in turn lobby for more regulations and higher taxes, which don't usually solve that problem. And finally, looking at oversight generally, uh, I was very, very pleased to see, Mr. Chairman, that you said uh, last October that oversight is not and should not be used as a political weapon. Uh, we understand that that is the most important function of this committee. Taxpayers deserve to know, as you said in your mission statement, how their money is being spent. When this committee or any other committee decides that a program is not being effective, taxpayers want to know why, so that when action is taken to reform or terminate the expenditure of their money, they want to know why it is being done, and if something is being expanded, they want to know why it is being effective. Uh, we have often suggested that constituents ask their members of Congress for the 10 most effective and the 10 least effective programs. Unfortunately, the answer often is the 10 programs on which Congress spends the most money and the 10 programs on which they spend the least money. That is never the right answer, and we hope that every member becomes more educated and spends a lot more time reviewing which programs truly are effective. Thank you for uh, allowing me to testify today. Thank you. Mr. Rowan. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Chairman Issa and Ranking Member Cummings, uh, for allowing me to testify today on behalf of the American taxpayer. My name is Andrew Moylan, and I am Vice President of Government Affairs for the National Taxpayers Union. We are a nonpartisan citizen group founded in 1969 to work for lower taxes and smaller government at all levels. Uh, we are the oldest uh, such organization in the world. We have uh, 362,000 members nationwide uh, in every single state and likely in all of your districts as well. I will start with an old joke that our budget tells us what we can't afford, but it sure doesn't keep us from spending money on it. Uh, and unfortunately, that's been true of Washington for far too long. Our current situation is bleak, and I wanted to point out just a couple of nuggets to illustrate that. Uh, first of all, President Obama's recent budget estimate estimated our overspending, our overspending problem this year at roughly $1.6 trillion, which is equal in inflation-adjusted terms to the entire Federal budget of 1982. Uh, to restate that a bit, we will raise through the tax code and spend in real terms roughly the federal budget of 2003, and on top of that, we will also spend the budget of 1982, again, in real terms. Uh, second, in the President's budget outline, the lowest single-year deficit in the coming decade is $607 billion, which is a number higher in absolute terms than every deficit from 1789 to 2008, and roughly equal in, again, real terms to overspending in war mobilized 1944. Uh, finally, while many in Congress have attributed the recent spending surge to crisis response due to a financial meltdown and the resulting recession, the Federal Government has actually run a deficit in 51 of the last 60 years, which is something that we think ought to give pause even to diehard Keynesians who believe that uh, in economic growth cycles that surpluses should be the norm. But instead of listing just the parade of horribles, I wanted to try and draw up a parade of solutions for you. Uh, there is a lot of hard stuff that needs to be done, and much of that we deal with in the written testimony that I submitted to the committee. But I wanted to instead focus my remarks on what we regard as the low-hanging fruit of waste. Uh, it won't shock anyone in this committee to hear that NTU thinks that the Federal Government spends too much money. But whether or not you agree with that assessment, I hope you can agree that we can spend that money in a much smarter fashion than we are today. Uh, and that is why we joined with the U.S. Public Interest Research Group, uh, who, with whom we have uh, many disagreements, but some agreements as well, to author a report called Toward Common Ground, Bridging the Political Divide to Reduce Spending. And in that report, we identified over 30 specific recommendations to reduce Federal spending by up to $600 billion uh, by tackling waste by the middle part of the decade. And incidentally, I would note that NTU and PERG were sitting together before the State of the Union made it cool, uh, as our previous work includes issues like spending transparency. Um, to steal a joke from Conan O'Brien, I heard that President Obama took his daughters to see the 3D version of Avatar, and at the end of the film, one of his daughters elbowed him and said, now that is how you spend a half a billion dollars. And unfortunately, American taxpayers are spending over half a trillion dollars on such things as flood insurance for repeatedly flooded homes, 
overpayments through the SSI program and the National Drug Intelligence Center, which is located in the heart of the drug war in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, uh, among many, many other things. These items have been on watchdog lists for years, and uh, opposition to these recommendations tends not to be primarily political or ideological in nature, but parochial. Uh, just a couple of the highlights, $62 billion in savings we identified from el eliminating wasteful subsidies for agricultural products and corporations, $353 billion in improvements to contracting and asset acquisition, $77 billion in uh, improvements to program execution, and $107 billion in canceling or modifying ineffective military programs. I would note that our earlier estimates were actually closer to a trillion dollars by the middle part of the decade, but we tried as hard as we could to back up each one of these suggestions with a credible estimate of the real spending impact as well as a, an unimpeachable source like CBO or GAO. Uh, the NTU PERG report demonstrates that reduce, reducing wasteful spending is not a question of right or left, it's a question of right or wrong. And uh, I'll conclude by noting that I believe that this hearing is properly focused on the issue uh, of really what's causing our budget woes, which is overspending. While revenue is set to return to uh, post-war averages in relatively short order, even if we do extend all of the 2001-2003 tax cuts, spending is projected to be well above post-war averages for the coming decade and will skyrocket after that. And that's why it's important for Congress to eliminate wasteful spending, tackle entitlement reforms, and institute constitutional limits on the size of government moving forward. If we fail to seize that opportunity, the result could be a painful debt crisis that will develop not over the span of six months, but over the span of six hours on a Sunday evening as we're sitting with our families and folks in Asian markets are beginning to stampede away from American debt. Uh, to modify a line from our president, I hope we can look back together on this time and say that this was the moment when the rise of red ink began to slow and our budget began to heal. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Kalman. Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings and members of the committee, I thank you for inviting me to testify today on behalf of the U.S. Public Interest Research Group, U.S. PERG. U.S. PERG, the Federation of State PERGs, uh, is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that advocates and educates on matters to encourage a fair and sustainable economy, protect the public health, and foster responsive democratic government. The level of Federal spending is of great concern to Americans. A November Pew Research Center poll showed that 70 percent of Americans believe Federal spending is an urgent problem. Other opinion research indicates that the public concerns are focused on waste, whether it is fought for and won by narrow interests, programs that have outlived their usefulness, or blatant inefficiencies that have been allowed to continue for years. We are proud uh, to have partnered with the National Taxpayers Union to develop the list of spending reductions detailed in our October 2010 report toward common ground. The report details more than $600 billion in specific spending cuts over five years. These spending cuts are a good place to start, but not only because of the current budget situation. In good fiscal times and bad, during years of budget surpluses or deficits, taxpayers deserve to know that their money is being well spent, that it is going to true public priorities, and that there is accountability in the system through uh, common sense reforms. While there is any number of issues that may divide U.S. PERG and NTU, and our respective memberships, there are broad areas where we can come together and support responsible and accountable spending of taxpayer dollars. One message of our joint report is for Congress to start where there is agreement from across the political spectrum. I would like to share with you U.S. PERG's approach to the spending cuts. We entered our partnership with NTU uh, guided by four basic principles. First, uh, to oppose subsidies that provide incentives to companies that do direct harm to the public interest or do more harm than good. An example here, uh, we would say, is subsidies to ethanol, for which, according to researchers at the University of Minnesota and elsewhere, there is very little, if any, truth to the benefits of ethanol, and there are clearly adverse environmental impacts. Second, uh, we oppose subsidies to mature, profitable industries that don't need the incentive. These companies would engage in the activity regardless of taxpayer support. We would include in this category subsidies, as has been mentioned by now all three of us, the Market Access Program, among other, uh, which, among other things, effectively pay for overseas television advertising and other marketing of specific products to successful multi-billion dollar companies. These companies have both the incentive and the resources to do their own product promotion without taxpayer handouts. Third, support common sense reforms to make the government more efficient. Examples here include the reducing of the inventory of unused or underused government buildings, as was mentioned before. Um, and uh, as Congresswoman Spears pointed out, we have a lot to do in contracting. 
uh, and uh, would be happy to talk later on about a report we did called Forgiving Fraud and Failure, which was the repeated uh, issuance of contracts and renewing of contracts despite uh, the fact that they didn't deliver. Fourth, uh, and finally, we would oppose funding where there is authoritative consensus to do so. This means strong independent agreement across the political spectrum that a program is wasteful and the agency or department receiving the funding has actually argued against it. A specific example is here, again, uh, just to repeat, the National Drug Intelligence Center, which has been the subject of numerous unfavorable reports about its impact and effectiveness. The GAO has concluded that it duplicates existing efforts. A particular value of the recommendations detailed in the report is that they are specific. They focus on agreed-upon wasteful spending. Along those lines, I would just note that USPIRG does not actually support across-the-board cuts. Such policies fail to differentiate between true public priorities and where there is genuine waste or inefficiencies in the system. Americans certainly prioritize national defense, but if efficiencies can be made to the way in which we repair military vehicles, the military is often exempt from across-the-board cuts, that savings is no less important than reforms to streamline the costs of Medicare. While not in the report, USPIRG would also urge the committee uh, to review special interest carve-outs through tax expenditures and loopholes. These expenditures have the same bottom line effect on our Nation's deficit as direct line item spending. Regardless of whether spending takes place through the tax code or the appropriations process, it should be part of the conversation and should be transparent, accountable, and serve the public. Let me end by saying that many of the items on our list challenge longstanding subsidies to narrow special interests. While these expenditures serve little or no continuing public purpose, there will no doubt be intense lobbying efforts to preserve the handouts. We urge you to resist those efforts and take the first important steps towards addressing our Federal spending problem and ensuring that pub any public expenditure is for the public interest. We applaud the Committee for looking anew at these giveaways and urge you to challenge tradition in the difficult decisions to reform the budget. Uh, decisions that lie ahead. Thank you. Thank you. I recognize myself for first round of questioning for five minutes. Mr. Schatz, your uh, critical waste issue uh, of the 112th Congress, it has an area that, that piqued my interest on page 17, and I would ask unanimous consent that this entire document be placed in the record without objection so ordered. But on page 17, it makes uh, a statement, uh, USA Today, I guess, is the source for it, that 83 percent uh, of all uh, public employee jobs pay greater than their comparable private sector counterparts. Uh, when we are looking at trying to figure out waste, would you categorize paying more than what the private sector pays for comparable work as as a waste, and if so, would this be perhaps the largest waste there is in all of government? There are some caveats that went with that proposal. There are some arguments that uh, Federal workers are more educated on average than the private sector workers. But looking at apples to apples, we would like to see a report from the Congress that really details where this lies. I mean, the Cato Institute has looked at this for years, and I think people used to believe that this was not the case. I think currently based both on compensation and benefits that public employees at every level of government are being paid at a higher level. Now, whether that means there are too many of them, they are overcompensated, uh, are we getting something out of them that is worth that compensation? These are all questions that need to be examined. Uh, so we don't want to say just we do actually think that Federal salaries should be reduced because uh, private sector, if you have a job, you are lucky to have one. Most people haven't had a raise. I was uh, encouraged that the President has looked at salaries and said we should freeze them. That is a good first step. But then we have to determine which programs are worth continuing and within there what is a fair rate of pay so that we are really not overpaying. Uh, as I said, compensation benefits in particular, especially the benefits, now are uh, much better than the private sector. One of the questions I would have following up on that would be, do you believe the government can come up with a, and I will use the British word, scheme, in which we can have a dynamic pay uh, schedule similar to the private sector so that we don't underpay? Because obviously some of the public sector employees are underpaid compared to comparable private sector, and this is often where we get a drain. So do you believe it is possible at all for the Federal Government to significantly improve so that we don't overpay and underpay? 
And wouldn't that be inherently a complete change in our schedules? Absolutely. We have seen a lot of changes over the years or attempts to change civil service compensation. I recall when President Carter came in, that was one of the first things he did, and nobody really talked to him for a while after that. But it is something that needs to be done. It needs to be done on a bipartisan basis. There are some very high level uh, and very well educated positions that we do need. Uh, think about security or uh, nuclear weapons. I mean, you can't just take somebody off the street essentially and have them perform that task. So they may be some may be underpaid compared to the private sector. But one of the examples given in here was a, a cook, literally, right, I noticed being that. paid at a far greater rate than a comparable private sector individual. Uh, and I, uh, as I said, I think this committee in particular would be well served to come up with something that is objective, that looks at it program by program, and really makes a good determination about what is the fair level, because we could save a lot of money. Uh, and we do recommend here, by the way, an across-the-board reduction of 10 percent. And again, we think that is consistent with what needs to be done to get spending under control in general. I appreciate that. Uh, let me I am going to go a little off script, but it is important because I don't often get such a good panel here to, to go into another area. The first panel, and every panel that has been before Congress so far, has said the only way we are going to get to a reasonably balanced budget, in other words, deal with our overspending, includes waste, includes closing unnecessary programs, it includes pay analysis, but it also includes taking on entitlements. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you the toughest question. Do you believe that Congress can successfully convince the American people that entitlements, Social Security and Medicare, are not, in fact, a entitlement, a absolute health care program for the aged, an absolute uh, retirement program, but rather part of a social welfare safety net and thus can be means tested? I think that that is one approach, certainly. Raising the retirement age is another. People are living longer. Uh, you may not recall this, but the first individual that received Social Security was named Ida Mae Fuller. She lived until she was, I believe, 88, which was far longer than they expected. And so the actuarial tables are not accurate. Uh, there was an anomaly, for example, in Medicare when it was first uh, enacted that also looked at how long people would live, because you can't have an insurance program or a payment program uh, and have it be sustainable financially if they are going to pay out more than they take in. It is just simple math. So there are a lot of ways to look at reforming these programs. Uh, we think that it has to be done. We were encouraged that the President said. Right, but I am we asking, yes, well, asking you for the tougher. I am asking you for the tougher question oh, here. About whether it is social welfare or Can we define it as social welfare safety net, I will use the entire term, mm -hmm. so that we can, in fact, means test in some way both of those programs, at least partially, because everybody says there's you know only so many solutions. Mm -hmm. That is the one that that's seldom talked about, which is the only way to say that if you are like myself and you have enough income outside of Congress, that when I am 70, I actually won't need my Social Security in order to still be well-to-do. Mm -hmm. Yes or no, do you believe Congress has the ability to convince the American people, separate from do they have the will? I think that conversation needs to be started, because if it is thought of as an entitlement, people don't want to give it up. We have a health care bill where now people think health care is an entitlement. Okay. I so I think it, it is really expanding more than it is being reduced. Uh, Please. Qu Mr. Qu Chairman, if I may, I, I, do I think that Congress has the ability? Yes, I do. Uh, am I convinced that Congress will utilize that ability? Uh, that I'm not so convinced of yet, and you know the the way that I uh, keep talking to people about these programs is that whether we like it or not, they are gutting themselves from the inside right now. Uh, if we do not make serious changes to them, we're going to rapidly approach the point where uh, Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security take up nearly as large a portion uh, of our uh, economy as a whole as the entire federal budget today. And uh, to be able to head that off, we need to start entitlement reform now. Thank you, Mr. Kalman. Just a yes or no, if you could. If, if you can, I'll come back in a second round. Otherwise, yeah, I'll. okay. Thank you. Uh, I now recognize the ranking member. The, um, you know, I was just listening to your uh, testimony. It's very interesting, um, and I, you know, when it comes, you all heard the uh, Senator McCaskill. Were you all here for that? Mm -hmm. yes, and you've heard all the discussion with regard to um, these contracts that. Um, we are 
particularly in defense, we're not, we don't seem to be in control of. I just wondered what comments did you have on that, uh, Mr. Moore? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, that's Could you an be brief because I have a number of things. I'm it's an extraordinarily important part of the puzzle in terms of uh, tackling wasteful spending, and that was actually a big part of the report that we did with U.S. PERG, is uh, identifying some of those reforms that could be made. The Bi Bipartisan Defense Acquisition Panel made some uh, very worthwhile suggestions, and those are a part of our report. If I may briefly, yeah. uh, we were around when the Klinger Cohn Act came along. We have seen a lot of defense procurement. Twenty-five percent of the Grace Commission's recommendations dealt with defense. And our organization helped publicize the $436 hammers and the $640 toilet seats. So we are well aware of what needs to be done in contracting and defense. And I am just wondering, when you look at your organizations and you are dedicated to effective and efficient use of taxpayer dollars, um, and you hear, I think it was Ms. Spear who talked about how um, frustrating it is to constantly be going over these problems over and over and over again. And we end up looking kind of, um, it looks as if we can't get it done or else we don't want to get it done. And then we look at all the resources that are being put into these hearings. And, and don't, don't, don't get me wrong, I am glad that the Chairman held this hearing and I am glad that we are on the road that we are on our way. To, but I, I guess what I'm trying to get to is that, I mean, the older I get, the more I, I value my time. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to make sure that the time that we have under our watch, all of ours, is that we do something to actually make a, make a difference. And so I just, I mean, and I, I appreciate the fact that these two organizations got together. That's great. I think that, that's a good start. Uh, but I'm just trying to figure out, you know, what do you, one, I mean, what do you see? In other words, I'm trying to get to how do we not be where Ms. Spear talked about, where two years from now we're talking about the same problems and they're getting worse. And, you know, we were able to make some difference in the Coast Guard. That's a smaller organization, but it was through just sheer pushing and setting deadlines, as the Chairman often talks about. I mean, but what do you all? I mean, you, I mean, how do you work yourself out of a job? That's what I'm trying to get. To. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, I've been at this probably longer than uh, these gentlemen. Yeah, and I don't want you. But, you know, but I, do you no, understand I, I how serious? It, I'm no, very I, serious about this. No, no. I don't want I you to. I, I mean, you do a great job, but I don't want you to die. Right. Still no, fighting, and the problem is worse. Well, the part of the problem is the priorities in Congress. That members traditionally have been happier spending the money, putting their name on a road or a building, and taking credit for doing something, whatever it might be, because they think that might help them get reelected, to be perfectly frank. If we can get enough members that say, I will fix a problem because that is the right thing to do, they will probably get reelected with an even bigger majority because they will be able to go back home and say, look, I did something that made the government work better. We don't want people to have less faith in the government. And yes, we talk a lot about what's wrong because that, that really gets people's attention. But fixing it is really something that needs to be at the forefront of people's minds. A lot of times agency heads come in, uh, presidents come in and say, let's fix the problem. There is entrenched bureaucracy that doesn't want to change. So it takes, it's a very, uh, it has to be an effort that is a collaboration between the executive branch, Congress, among these organizations, and so that when people look at something, they say, we are going to give you credit for fixing the problem, not just going around spending money. Mm -hmm. um, Congressman, uh, I think it's, it is a great question, and I am glad you all are focused on this. I would say a couple of things. One is that um, it is the fact that we need, I think, uh, to start where we can agree. In, in other words, a lot of these fights end up happening um, at the places we disagree. And so the value, and what I said in my testimony and would reiterate, is the value of a group like NTU partnering with U.S. PERG gives you a roadmap for a few places where if parties got together and said, this is where we can go, then you would have actually backup from folks that can talk to their memberships across the country. So that is the first thing. The second thing I would say is there are some places where um, there has been progress made, not obviously enough. 
Um, but last year, in a unanimous, uh, uh, unanimously through the House, there was acquisitions reforms that were made to the weapons uh, procurement system. That took care of about 20 percent of, uh, of the problem. But if we can handle, if we can go after weapons systems, which arguably is one of the harder things to go after, then hopefully we can introduce and get a bill, you all can uh, pass a bill that would take care of the re remaining 80 percent. So I think there are building blocks on which you can focus on to make some serious progress. Um, over in the Senate side is the last thing I would say um, on a number of, uh, on, uh, for example, issues like offshore tax havens, which is not necessarily something that everybody agrees on. Mr. Grassley and Mr. Levin are getting together and talking about how to close some of those abuses uh, and ways to raise some revenue. So I, I think there are things and seeds that are out there, but we need to focus on where we agree. Uh, may I? I I think that, and I submitted this in my written testimony, that the math on the dollars and cents is easy. It's the political calculus that's been difficult. Um, and just to explain part of that, uh, President Obama's recent budget uh, had some suggestions for terminations, over a billion dollars of which were repeated suggestions from President Bush's last uh, proposed budget. So there are a billion dollars worth of reductions that both of those very different men uh, agreed upon that have still not been implemented in terms of reductions. Uh, I think that those are things that we ought to be targeting. That is the low-hanging fruit. We identified uh, $600 billion more that we think is low-hanging fruit. Uh, and after that point, that is when we can climb up a little higher, fight about what fruit to pick and, uh, and how big they ought to be. And uh, I can say that we as an organization and I as an individual am committed to making that political calculus easier because that is the only way we are ever going to get this done. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The gentlelady from California, Ms. Spear, for five minutes. I have got to say that if there ever was a moment in time when we can come together and show the American people that Republicans and Democrats want to save the taxpayers money and we commit to do that from this committee, mm -hmm. I mean, we can change the world in a, in a small way but a very significant way. And I think the fact that Mr. Moylan and Mr. Kalman have come together from very different places and have created a list for us of uh, things that they can agree on then I would suggest, Mr. Chairman, we should sit down and see if we can agree on these particular um, suggested areas. I mean, if, if in fact, the, the suggestion that we can save hundreds of millions of dollars by just ending the orders for obsolete spare parts for the military, come on, if we can't do that, we should get the heck out of here. So I would suggest that we take this list, we come together, and this committee come forward with, uh, at the very least, um, you know, a number, if not all, of these um, suggested um, savings. I want to see if we have buildings, we've got 55,000 federal buildings that are not utilized or underutilized. Let's just take the not utilized ones and get rid of those. Mm -hmm. Or the, the folks that are living in areas that continue to flood and we are spending $891 million on repeat um, claims, where 1 percent of the policies are generating 25 to 30 percent of the claims, I would like to know what that specific number is. We could probably give them $500,000 apiece to buy homes in other areas and save a lot of money. So those are the kinds of things that I would like to see us pursue, Mr. Chairman. Let me just ask about this market access program. This to me is, is pretty outrageous that we are paying Sunkist and McDonald's to advertise in France and other locales around the world. I, what could possibly justify us to continue that program? Will each of you respond to that? Uh, we have all been looking at this for quite some time. Uh, NTU and, and CAGW have co-signed letters on this program for probably 10 years. Representative Chabot from Ohio, who was recently reelected, used to bring amendments to the floor every year on the appropriations bills. I believe an amendment was being offered on the continuing resolution. I don't know what happened to it. I do know, by the way, the National Drug Intelligence Center amendment was adopted, so hopefully that will finally disappear. But market access, uh, it is the power of the companies that get the money that keeps it going. And uh, we hope that there is now the political will to say this is a huge amount of corporate welfare should be eliminated. Uh, there has been bipartisan support, but just not a majority so far. But it is really due to the power of these companies and their lobbying operations to come in and say, no, no, we really need this million dollars. It is going to help increase sales, help jobs. And by the way, we have a plant in your district. 
I, I would say that uh, while it's absolutely key to point out that there are large corporations that are benefiting from it, it's not just corporations. There are also large trade associations that are, uh, of course, comprised of a lot of those that benefit as well. And they make uh, very high-minded arguments about raising demand for certain types of products. There was an article recently uh, where a gentleman was making the argument that we need to raise foreign demand for cotton so that we have uh, greater demand for the products that cotton farmers in this country are producing. The way that we look at it as an organization is that uh, entities like this that have significant profits on their own ought to be able to uh, fund their own advertising and promotion uh, techniques. And uh, taxpayers have many more important things to deal with. And uh, whether, you know, as Gary said, whether the budget situation is good or bad, it does not make sense to be uh, subsidizing uh, entities like that. And I would just uh, quickly add that, you know, there, there is uh, presumably a debate to be had whether or not the Commerce Department has a role in going out to open up foreign markets for American businesses. There can't, when you start saying, no, 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 we are going to give specific companies to advertise to sell Big Macs in Paris, the argument really begins to, to fall into the absurdity. And so we would argue that whatever original purpose the program may have had, it is completely veered off that, pro that original purpose and is now not serving any kind of purpose that promotes any value to the American taxpayer. By the way, very cleverly, they changed the name from the market promotion program, and it was promoting our products to market access, meaning we want access to markets overseas because they may be excluding our products. So even there, it sounds even a little better than what they had in the past. Uh, my time has almost expired. Just tell me some of the companies. Besides Sunkist and McDonald's, who are the other companies receiving money? Uh, and, uh, our report notes Nabisco, Fruit of the Loom, uh, Mars Incorporated. Uh, there is a long list of, of many others where that came from. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. I'm uh, going to do a br very brief second round. Mr. Kellman, I kind of cut you off without being able to answer the question, but I'll rephrase it. The, uh, I'll, I'll do it this way. I had a, a prominent bank chairman, somebody with a seven-figure salary in a large home in a low-tax state, who came in to see me. He's a little, he's a little older than his wife. He has a 10- and a 12-year-old, but he's over 65. <laughs> His two children each receive $800 a month because back in Lyndon Johnson's day, we decided that retirees should have supplemental funds and death benefits that would go to the children directly over and above. We talked about, social, uh, we talked about corporate welfare. Is there any reason today that that shouldn't be part of the waste within Social Security. If somebody is making a six or seven figure salary, they're, just because they are over 65 and have children under 18, should we automatically continue that? And that is why when I said entitlement, everything is an entitlement once we write it into law. But is it really an entitlement to somebody who doesn't need the money and for, for a program that actually never defined its real purpose. Is there a purpose to give children under 18 $800 simply because one of their parents is over 65, even if that parent is still working and earning a handsome income? So I will leave it to you, because one, this is about waste. It is about government waste. But the two biggest potential rocks in the knapsack of, uh, of our country that are, might take us, take us down are Social Security and Medicare in the opposite order. You would like to respond. Uh, sure. Um, and by the way, that is not going to completely balance the budget if we just do away with the, the high income over 65 with children under 18. Uh, I, I understand and appreciate that. Um, I, I, let me say two things. Uh, one is just uh, to be quite frank is that uh, U.S. PER does not take positions on the level of benefits for Social Security or Medicare. That said, um, we actually do have in our And the question wasn't do you, is that a wrong benefit? It's is it the type of benefit that Congress should look at anew relative to recategorizing it in some way for means testing or at least not to make it an automatic entitlement? Yeah, and, and I, I apologize, but we don't have a specific position Either, on that. Okay. But let me yes, let sir. me let me say this that uh, we do think that, for example, uh, there are a number of things in Medicare and Medicaid that, in particular, that should be looked at. We are not against looking at that. In fact, in Medicaid, for example, there are a number of states that 
um, in which uh, name brand pharmaceuticals have uh, put on their actuary, gotten into the states to adopt actuaries that forbid Medicaid from purchasing generic drug alternatives. So Medicaid ends up spending a lot more money um, than they otherwise would. They have lobbied for built-in uh, uh, monopolies. Protections. So we would, uh, we would say, you know, people who say, oh, you know, we should leave entitlements off the table, we think that there are huge efficiencies, billions and billions of da taxpayer dollars that um, that program that is not just, I mean, obviously we can all agree on the actual fraud in Medicare, we should go after that. If I guarantee you housing, it shouldn't have to be the Ritz-Carlton. Exactly. We should, so we do believe that there are um, opportunities to make huge savings in those programs by looking at how they are actually being implemented. On that side, we can agree. Any other responses? I, I would also point out, and you touched on the public opinion portion of it, that I think that there is something of a, a structural problem in how these programs are viewed. Uh, you know, people are well aware of the payments that they make into these systems for years and decades. And so I think they, to some extent, rightly feel that when they get to retirement age, that they ought to be able to draw upon those benefits as they were promised to them. If so they only knew that they only pay into Part A, B, C, and D, are not, in fact, paid for out of withholding, but rather through general tax revenue? Well, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a more basic problem than that, which is that when Social Security was first drawn up, it was not something akin to a forced savings program. We had this pay-as-you-go system. And I think that that is a part of the big disconnect that we face here today, and that is a part of what makes uh, dealing with these programs more difficult than it might otherwise be. I am going to ask one closing question very quickly, uh, because this one hits home. Uh, in a little while, I think we are going to have an amendment uh, we are going to vote on to make an across-the-board cut to the branch, literally to consider further cutting the budget that the ranking member and I share to try to go after waste and, and, and misuse of government funds. And I am probably going to vote no, uh, because I don't believe you cut off the auditor's uh, fund in order to get a better running of, of an enterprise. But in, the, uh, in this report that is already uh, in, I noticed something. There is a proposal here that members of Congress cut off franking in election years, in other words, not just 90 days, but cut it off altogether. I would appreciate a little elaboration, because I found it to be very insightful that although I think we should be able to respond to inquiries, in other words, our mail should continue, the, the history of, of franking right up until the eve of, of the cutoff for the primary or general is certainly something that if we look at ourselves through a, a fair mirror, we are going to see something we don't like. Well, first, the Senate does limit franking. Uh, the general lady oh, uh, was going to uh, yield to her. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I must say that I have um, discovered the franking, quote, benefit to be outrageous. And uh, if you want to associate on that issue, I would be delighted I think the to think. And I found that out by happenstance. I was doing a uh, one, one a year newsletter to my constituents to tell them what I had done during the year and found out it was going to cost $100,000 to send it out, and I refused to do it. And with the eve of the electronic newsletter and everything else we have at our, our disposal, I think that benefit should cease. But please, well, uh, as we said in the report, in the days of the Pony Express, this might have made sense, but it certainly doesn't now. There is so much information, Twitter, Facebook, MySpace, I don't want to leave anyone out, email, uh, texting, town hall meetings, teletown halls. If a member of Congress wishes to let their constituents know what they are doing, there are, there are so many outlets now that did not exist before that we believe firmly, and we have always believed this, that a member of Congress should only respond to a constituent if they are asked a question, and because that is a legitimate function of what members of Congress do. Uh, we have got C-SPAN, we have got, you know, we Everything going on. There's more information now about the hearings with the new rules. We, we are both being advertised here today with this exactly, hearing. I'm sure. Exactly. So I, I think that this is something. This time is coming. I know NTU in particular has done a great job on this issue over the years. So I, want, I would love to have uh, Andrew make a comment as well. Yeah. I mean, we've we've done a tremendous amount of work on uh, abuses of the franking process. But I wanted to touch on sort of the more general point that you made. Um, I often make the argument that one of the reasons that I believe so deeply in limited government is precisely because I don't think that we spend enough money on the things that matter. Uh, and that is why across the board cuts ought to be sort of a last resort rather than a first resort, because uh, as our organizations jointly have pointed out and many others, 
there are there are higher priority things and there are lower priority things and uh, we ought to start by eliminating the lower priority things first and so uh, I, I think that a franking benefit is uh, among those and as Tom pointed out uh, there are innumer innumerable uh, ways that you can communicate with your constituents that don't require taxpayers to underwrite it, and I think that we ought to pursue those. Thank you. And uh, I, I know that uh, if I'd gotten into the study of malt liquor and marijuana in in, uh, in combination, which is being funded, we might have had another ten minutes. But I recognize the ranking member for final comments. Thank you very much. I want to thank you all for being here, and I just want to go to you, Mr. Shasta, just make one uh, quick comment. Um, you know, I, I was listening to your responses and uh, with regard to public employees, I think we have to be very, very careful when we try to make these comparisons and contrasts. And I think you have been sensitive to it. Um, I, I look at, and, I, and so, you know, I know you all speak in a lot of places and you tell a lot of stories, but this is one I want you to tell. Almost every one of my employees on this committee took a substantial pay cut. They were here, they are here night after night. Many of them, uh, we have a Harvard Law School graduates, I mean, sitting right up here. And I'm sure that, I don't know what happened on the other side, but what I'm saying is, is that we've got a lot of great people who do a lot of sacrificing. And I, and, and it, and I tell you, it, it makes me want to scream sometimes when I hear, and I'm not just talking about Democrats, I'm talking about Republican staff too, um, about public employees and how they are, uh, you know, uh, got these high salaries and, you know, they couldn't do better in uh, private uh, industry. I guarantee you most of them could, but we've got a lot of people who dedicate their lives to just trying to do what is right and make things better for people. And I get kind of emotional about it because I, I hear it over and over again, and I think it's, it's, it's quite unfair uh, so often. Then I want to talk about this whole thing of systemic fraud. I'm going to be doing a, I'm doing a speech at Howard University soon. Well, I'm going to be talking about the fact that we need to create a new normal. And that is, is that it seems like when I listen to the thing about contracting, um, I think it has become normal for certain contractors to expect to fraudulently uh, get money from the government. It has become a part of, of the process. And that's, that's, that's sad. It really is. And so that's the normal. And I mean, then when, and, and I think it was the chairman maybe that asked, was asking questions about, um, you know, it was somebody on the Republican side, and it was a very good question about is this, is this criminal? Is it whatever? And I think it was Mr. Dodaro who said, yeah, he said something about, um, well, it, there's a certain threshold that we look at and whatever. But the fact is, is that the normal has become, let's, you know, get something from the government. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and I am convinced that we can do better than that. We really can. And when I think about where we are with regard, and I was mentioning this to the chairman a few minutes ago, where we are with regard to technology, mm -hmm. you know, and the things, I mean, we, we can, we can, we can literally take GPS and zero in on one by somebody's backyard. Mm -hmm. You mean to tell me we can't keep up with contracts? I mean, particularly when these contracts are costing the American people so much money. I, I, I agree with the, the chairman with regard to our um, mission statement. This is about, this is bigger than us. This is about and it's bigger than one party. It's bigger than Democrats or Republicans. It's about taking the hard-earned dollars of Americans and trying to make sure that they're spent effectively and efficiently. And I, and and you know, the two things that I just said are are, are linked. The thing about employees, we got a lot of great employees, and I think we need to be careful about beating up on them all the time. Because, and I'm not just talking about the people up here. Mm -hmm. They're the same public employees that you know uh, collect our trash the same ones that deliver our mail. I mean, that, that, that's real. And, they, and a lot of these people, I think, probably most of them, are underpaid. And at the same time, we also need to use our technology to, you know, you know, we've got the bashing over here, but then we need to move to our technology and say, okay, 
How do we use this technology to bring that effectiveness and efficiency to government to help those employees accomplish the things that they need to accomplish? That's what it's all about. And so we can, we can spend, 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 and we have been concentrating on spending uh, here lately, but we also need to, and I think the Chairman said it in his opening, that when we find ways that we can save money, we need to double down on that. We need to, to do that because a plenty, you know, if we can save some pennies, that means everybody benefits. And when government benefit, when government is, is, is really doing things effectively and efficiently, we all benefit. And, and then that way we bring value, more proud value to the lives of all Americans. And that is what it is all about. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman and I thank our witnesses today. I think if there is ever a time in which uh, points were scored for the American people and not by one party or the other here on the da dais, today was that day. I would again like to thank all the witnesses for their testimony. The record will stay open for, five, or sorry, for seven days. If there are additional comments that you would like to uh, have placed in the record, I would ask unanimous consent at this time that, that you be able to do so, and without objection, so ordered. And with that, we stand adjourned. Uh. That's a good answer to that question. Huh?